All right, hello everyone. On behalf of FaceTab and National Defense University, I would like to welcome you to the 2022 annual update for the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. My name is Dr. Dorothy Potter and I'm a professor of practice at the National Defense University CFO's Academy. This year, NDU CFO Academy is very, is very pleased to be co-hosting this annual FaceTab update. The missions of FaceTab and NDU CFO Academy align in that we both have an interest in increasing knowledge and understanding of financial reporting in the federal sector. The session today will not only help ensure that you are up to date on FaceTab activities and how FaceTab guidance may impact financial reporting practices and disclosures at your agency, but demonstrates how NDU and FaceTab are ever committed to improving federal financial management. Thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the program. I will now turn it over to my fellow professor, David Harmon. Thank you, Dr. Potter. Uh, yes, this is David Harvey. Um, very happy to join you all today. Uh, I'm uh, planning to discuss uh, the collaboration efforts between uh, NDU CFO Academy and FaceApp in greater detail uh, at the end of the program. Uh, but for now, I'd like to uh, just say that the, both organizations, we're sort of uh, collaborating and focusing on our mutual strength to uh, leverage our resources to help each other, both in and out of the classroom, to promote uh, you know, better financial uh, management in the federal sector. Uh, so that said, let me now provide some highlights of what you're going to be hearing about today. Uh, uh, after I speak, there'll be a brief introduction by the FaceAB Assistant Director and NDU Visiting Professor, as well as our FaceAB Chair over at the CFO Academy, uh, Mr. Dom Savini. Uh, we will uh, start off with a presentation uh, from FaceAB's Executive Director, Ms. Monica Valentine, uh, followed by updates on several active FaceAB projects and discussions of recent guidance, including uh, land and leases accounting. Uh, we will also have a session on how you can become involved in the standard setting process. Uh, I've known uh, folks who have uh, volunteered on different committees and they've always said it was a, a very uh, rewarding experience. Uh, uh, and later in the session, we'll also have a couple of panel discussions regarding federal fiscal exposure associated with uh, climate risk and also accounting issues associated with uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, we'll also, uh, uh, FaceApp will also be issuing government CPE certificates to those in attendance today that complete uh, required polling questions. Uh, the first polling question will be coming up next, so please answer it uh, when it pops up on your screen. Uh, after the polling question, uh, Mr. Savini will introduce FaceApp's Executive Director, Ms. Monica Valentine. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the session, everybody. I think we're ready for the first polling question. All right. But everyone, please bear with me as we're working through a few tech issues. Okay, so with that, um, everyone should be a polling question on their screen. Shortly, yep. we're going to give yep. everyone a go. few minutes to answer. And I'll just remind everyone while we're we're waiting for everyone to answer that uh, in order to grant CPEs, we have to record polling question participation. So when you see the polling question pop up, please answer it. Um, I think Zoom makes it pretty easy. So hopefully everything goes smoothly tech-wise. 
And Monica, just let me know when I should end the poll. Okay, let's see, it says 90% participation. Let's see. Okay, I guess we can go ahead and end it. It looks like, it doesn't look like anyone else is adding to it. So go ahead and end it. And I will just share the results so everyone can see. And Monica, at this point, can you please record the answers for polling question number one? Will do. All right. And with that, I will stop sharing and then we'll we'll move on. Does that sound okay, Monica? Yes, yes. Turn it over to Dom. Well, good morning, Monica and everyone. Um, I want to welcome all of you out there. We have over 600 participants, and it's been about three years since we've last uh, seen you actually in person, at least most of you or, or many of you. Let me just first thank Josh Williams and Leah Kiger for pulling this off and getting all the technology and everything together. It was kind of hurting cats. Um, so thank you, Josh. Thank you, Leah. Thanks to the team for the support in putting this annual update together after a two-year hiatus. Before I introduce our esteemed Madam Executive Director, I do want to acknowledge our former director, Ms. Payne, and the prior board members who worked tirelessly over the years to leave us an outstanding legacy. We have inherited a gap or a house of gap built on a firm foundation. And it is with this foundation that we've initiated, under Monica's leadership, a training and outreach program, which many of you now have at least heard about or maybe even experienced in our various training classes that we've offered. As a result of Ms. Valentine's leadership and the support of our sponsors, we've engaged literally thousands of you in the last two and a half years with no-cost government CPE to the federal employees and meeting with our private partners as well to help not only increase accounting knowledge, but also address implementation issues. In short, as we now significantly expand our outreach, all of us on staff are committed to listening differently. Face I've always listened, but now, we're listening a little differently in our training and outreach. And we're encouraging all voices within the financial management community to share their concerns during these training and outreach events, which you'll learn more about later. As executive director, Monica has a tough job and manages our technical agenda and our program operations. Her experience includes extensive work in the area of property, plant, and equipment, as many of you know, leases, and classified activities. In fact, she actually made it into Rolling Stone magazine, and many can consider her now an official rock star. Prior to FaceApp, she was an auditor with KPMG. She's a proud graduate of Howard University with a business administration and accounting degree. And for me personally, she served as a mentor. And for all of us, she encourages us from day one when she became our esteemed Madam Executive Director to spread our wings. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you officially our Madam Executive Director, Ms. Monica Valentine, who, and never forget this, was appointed because she's anointed so you won't be disappointed. So let us all welcome Monica Valentine. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And, and Dom, thank you so much for that, uh, for that introduction. I think that's the first time I've probably ever been called a rock star, but I'll take that. Even for my children, I've never been called a rock star. But you are correct. The Rolling Stone did. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the most flattering uh, article, but I, I made it in. So thank you all. And um, you know, everything that Dom has said, I, I am very appreciative 
of and I, I just want to say thank you to the to the whole staff because they make my job much easier it's not an easy job but they make it easier because of the great support um, <clears throat> and then i also really want to thank dr Potter, potter and professor harvey for uh co-hosting this event with us it's it's good to get back it's it's been uh, as don said a couple of years so um so i appreciate it so thank you all uh it is, is my pleasure to to um lead this organization. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a little background on, on FaceApp for those that don't know. Um, we are one of four app standard setters in the United States uh, sanctioned by the AICTA. Uh, FaceApp was um, uh, created <laughs> in uh, 1991 uh, after the CFO Act of, of 1990. We have nine board members, six of those are non-federal and three from our, uh, the, the FaceApp sponsors, the Department of Treasury, the uh, Office of Management and Budget and the, um, uh, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office. Um, uh, George Scott is currently serving as the as the FaceApp chair. Um, so that's that's just a, a little little background on uh, who who FaceApp is. Uh, if there are any out there that uh, are not not certain. So next, uh, let's see our disclaimer. Yes, the views that you will hear today will be those of the individual speakers. All official FaceApp decisions are expressed in board publications after. Uh, extensive due process. All right, so got the disclaimer out of the way. Um, so as um, Dom had mentioned, you know, a lot has gone on since uh, many of us have been working uh, remotely uh, due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And it was important for FaceApp to make a, a, a really quick transition into uh, uh, this new uh, posture, and so we had to quickly move to virtual meetings, with which you know over time has um, uh, worked. The, the technology <laughs> has gotten better for us. Uh, we also have have been able to continue working on many issues, uh, many accounting issues, prior, prioritizing those issues. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the reexamination project a little later. <clears throat> um, so our work has has continued even through these um, these um, unprecedented unprecedented times. Uh, one of the other things uh, I want to continue to encourage everyone to um, uh, submit your technical inquiries when you have a question on the application of our standards. Um, we continue to get, um, you know, plenty of technical inquiries and, and the staff has done an outstanding job to uh, responding to those. So just want to encourage you to, to continue that. Uh, and as well, the, the training, uh, the amount of virtual training that we have done has, has really gone uh, above and beyond what, um, what I, I think what we were doing <laughs> prior to the, the remote working um you know dom has um, had several several different classes that he's been doing i'm sure many many of you have participated uh in those classes as he said he's done thousands um, um uh, alan uh, and myself we've we've done some classes actually prior to the remote uh working on um the gap hierarchy but alan has continued doing um, many classes on on leases. Robin continues to uh, teach classes on um, and, and give presentations on climate related events. Josh and Leah, uh, Melissa, everyone has been uh, really doing a great job as far as uh, getting out, participating in many many different uh, events, um, uh, giving FaceApp updates. Uh, 
remotely and and we're even getting to the point where we're starting to to get get around to some in person um, sessions. All right, so just going to just show show the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, Leah, you can move to the next slide. Sorry about that. Um, so the the agenda. This is uh, I'm not going to necessarily go through um, everything, but we're going to just start out with some general discussions and we're going to move into the active projects, recently issued guidance, and then we're going to um, also talk about how you can get involved. Again, uh, Leah is going to talk more about technical inquiries and how to how to stay connected. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, just talking a, a little bit about a couple general general topics, and and the first one is on the gap hierarchy. And you know, people oftentimes say, well, why do why do you always talk about the gap hierarchy? Well, the the hierarchy is is very important because I I look at it as as a tool to actually navigate uh, the use of our pronouncements because if you are not if you don't have the understanding of where each of these different pronouncements fit into the the gap hierarchy, you could um, it, it could cause confusion on how you apply the standard. So we have our level A gap gap uh, with our standards and interpretations, level B, the technical bulletins, um, level C, uh, our technical releases that come. Uh, through the AAPC, then we have level D, staff implementation guides and uh, widely recognized and prevalent uh, federal practices. Uh, so the important thing to remember here with the with the gap hierarchy is that the uh, any of the the guidance uh, B through D cannot conflict with the level A guidance. Um, and uh, in, in our technical bulletins, technical releases, staff implementation guidance, we uh, um, ensure that. Uh, so that's part of that's part of the process. So um, you know, so if you are reading one of our technical releases and you say, "Oh, it looks like it's conflicting with one of our standards," you know, reach out to us and and uh, so that we can uh, give you a clear understanding of that. So. That, that's the importance of the, uh, the gap hierarchy. Next slide, please. Um, so one of uh, the missions, well, I should say, the mission of FACEAP is to, is to serve the public interest by improving federal financial reporting by considering the needs of external and internal users of federal financial uh, information. And this is how we do it. We uh, this is and and I wrote a note. I said this is how we deploy that mission. Um, you know, we want to ensure that the information um, uh, in the financial reports are reliable, understandable, relevant, timely, consistent, and are comparable. Uh, so th these are all things that are that are very important. Um, uh, when the board is um, developing standards. And these uh, qualitative characteristics are outlined in our concept statement number number four. All right, next slide, please. Uh, just want to talk just, uh, just briefly about um, uh, one of the ways that you can learn more about uh, FaceApp. So as as, as other federal entities, we do issue an annual report. Uh, of course, ours is not nearly as extensive as, as the, the, the work that you all put into your, um, uh, into your annual report. So we do an annual report and, and three-year uh, three year plan. Uh, and in that report, we have a, a statement from the chair, statement from myself, uh, you'll also find out the, the status of our, our current projects, but then also there is a, a three-year plan. So there's a, a three-year plan that talks about the, the technical agenda and um, where those uh, where those where our projects are planning on on going. Um, uh, we put out our last report 
last November. Uh, we also asked for feedback from our stakeholders. Um, and, and we did get, we didn't, we don't get a lot of uh, responses back, you know, people commenting on our, our technical plan, but, you know, that information provides um, uh, good feedback for the board, uh, for the board to consider. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at that when we put out our um, fiscal year 22 annual report. All right. Um, all right, let's move on to our next polling question. And I am bringing that up right now, Monica. Everyone right. should see the polling question on their screen. And just as, a, right. as folks are, are putting in their answers, I do want to give a plug for our annual report and three-year plan, as Monica said, because it is such a good document, I think, for if, if someone is interested in learning more about us, it's a great overview. You can look at the projects. And as Monica said, those three-year projections of the plans, I just, it's a, it's a labor of love. So I, I just want to give a, another shout out for our annual report and three-year plan. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Leah. Uh, and, and Leah can, can give that shout out because she uh, is very involved in the, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, and, and putting that annual report, <laughs> that uh, annual report together. So I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And just let me know when you'd like me to close the poll, Monica. It looks like we're okay. about 85% now. So anyone who's not sure, just take a guess. <laughs> yes, yes, please do, please do. The, you, you are not going to be graded on uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> right and wrongness of your of your answers these um, polling questions will be used to um, uh, put together or, or to compare to you for your uh, cpe um, certificate so um, it is very important that you answer that everyone answers the polling questions in order to get those uh, tpe right so okay so I think we're, we're, we're at almost 90%, so, uh, and, and the numbers have slowed down, so. Great. All so right, I Leah. End, mm -hmm. I'll end the poll, and then as mm -hmm. Robin takes over, can you please record the responses? Yes, and, and I do want to say that, uh, let's see, can we see the, uh, the results? Yes, I should be sharing the results right now. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, I see it. Okay. There must be All a little right. lag. Looks like <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So it looks like um, overwhelmingly uh, the answer was correct. Uh, everyone got the answer correct. It is the uh, statements of federal accounting standards. So. All right. Well, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Robin to kick off the active project segment with climate impact and risk reporting. Thank you, Thank Monica. You. Thank you. So we're going to talk about our active projects now. And the first project we're going to talk about is the climate related financial reporting. We're really excited to have this project active. It became active in December. And um, right now, the first we're we have two phases In the first phase we're really wrapping up. It's the developing of a non authoritative staff education paper on what SFAS, the statements that are available for accounting reporting on climate related impacts and risks. Now, what does this mean? This, is a, this means it's non authoritative. We are not developing any new standards. We're not developing any new guidance. We are just presenting a catalog of existing statements that can help you determine how you should report on items like um, climate related events that have occurred. Um, the paper will discuss your assets, your liabilities, and other transactions that might relate to assets or liabilities, and we're pointing you in the direction of the standards. Now, it's interesting because our standards do not specifically talk to climate change or climate-related events. However, you can deduct from what's in there if you've had an asset that has been destroyed or impaired or needs deferred maintenance and, and repairs you will be able to tell how to use that guidance. Of course, if you have any questions, as we've been um, 
insinuating through this entire thing, please send in a technical inquiry, which Leah is going to talk about more later. The second phase, we will be developing a climate-related financial disclosure framework for the federal government. There are a number of organizations already out there working on disclosure frameworks around the globe, and we are following all of that information. We are looking at presenting to the board the TCFD as an option, which is the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure Re Recommendations. Um, as a beginning point to see how, if they want to use that, that will begin once we have posted the non-authoritative staff education paper. And we're looking at the staff paper going up on the web sometime in May, and then in June, we will begin the second phase. One thing I'd like to ask, and Sherry's gonna talk about this later about getting involved in our projects. If there's anybody out there who is be getting a, an expertise on TCFD, or any of the risks that are related, such as the physical risks, risks that would relate to your PP&E and um, or the transition risks that relate to your emissions um, change to net zero. Please reach out to me because I'm looking for that expertise to help present information to the board. The third thing, this is not a phase, this is an ongoing opportunity. We present clippings to the board as information comes in on climate, as the new, as the executive orders, come in and other standard setter disclosure activities, we present information to the board and it is coming fast and furious. So we try to just make sure that what is you know, sent out to the board is stuff that is relevant to what we're gonna be working on. So that is um, climate. We have a panel later, it starts at 11.05. And so please stay on to join us for that. We will have GAO and GSA talking about what they're working on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have the next slide. Thank you. So the next active um, project we're going to talk about, two of them under the reporting model, is management's discussion and analysis, which we call MDNA. And right now we are developing the proposed standards for an exposure draft. An exposure draft is when it goes out for comment, where it'll go out to the community, those of you that are listening, and you'll be able to provide us comments. So right now the board is working on that draft exposure draft, and um, it is based on their vision for what they want management to produce. They would like a streamlined and holistic MDNA that provides balanced, integrated, and concise information to help users of the MDNA and the financial reports to understand the financial position and condition of the reporting entity. This vision was based on the reporting objectives. There are four that come out of our SFAC one, which is budgetary integrity, operating performance, stewardship, and systems and controls. And we based our um, the vision, they, they went through an analysis, an extensive analysis on those. It also will is based on the SFAS 15 standards that are out there now and standards-based language in SFAC 3. And also the lessons learned from the MDNA pilot, which took place at this time last year. And any of those that are on, we would like to again, thank you for the extensive work you did on piloting um, that vision. So we also wanna emphasize that the new standards, the proposed standards will not affect SFAS 37. So any of you out there that are still providing social insurance information and in your MDNA, that will still continue and we will, it will not be affected by this standard, proposed standard. Okay, and the next one, please. And the next piece in the reporting model is the concepts omnibus. An omnibus is basically changes to existing standards. And so we are making changes to SFAC 2, which is our statement of federal financial accounting concepts. These are concept statements, as Monica talked about in the hierarchy. These are actually not in the hierarchy. They are there to help the board to develop standards. And these are the concepts on entity and display. So we are making some changes to what type of information is appropriate for note disclosures. And we're also amending and consolidating MDNA concepts. As I mentioned, SFAC 3, which is MDNA, has mostly standard based um, language in there about the MDNA. So we are going to be proposing to rescind that and incorporating um, what what is important into this omnibus. Now, this is in a pre 
ballot phase. It's almost ready to go. We're holding it until the MDNA is ready to go out for a ballot um, for um, comment period. So the two of those will go out at the same time because they each rescind, the MDNA will propose to rescind 15 SFAS standards, and this one will propose to rescind SFAC 3. I think it's really important to understand that when we send out um, for a rescission, you we cannot rescind a concept with a standard because it's not hierarchy, it's not gap. So a concept has to, rescind a concept and a statement has to rescind another statement. So I think that's really important to understand as far as how we're restructuring these um, standards and concepts to help with the reporting model um, concepts and standards. I hope I didn't add any more confusion there. And with that, um, I think the only other thing I wanted to say is that the climate will be at the table on Tuesday, the 26th at 1.15. The board has a short period of time to um, get that ready to go and post to the web. And then also we have three hours at the table for the MDNA on Wednesday, the 26th. So please join us from 9.30 to 12.30 to see the due process that's involved in getting the proposed standards ready for you to comment on. And thank you. With that, I'm gonna turn that over to, I think it's, Josh and to talk about some software technology. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I want to start, I am going to talk about software technology, but I want to start with uh, giving a, a bit of an overview of our uh, intangible asset project, uh, which the software technology is part of. So uh, a, a year and a half ago, uh, basically, I was assigned a research project um, to look into the need for just general intangible asset uh, reporting guidance. And a lot of people will think of when they hear intangible assets, will, will think of the standard things such as trademarks, patents, copyrights, uh, software, uh, very much so. Uh, and then maybe other sorts of sorts of rights, uh, maybe natural resource rights, um, things of that nature. Uh, so we did an extensive research project to one, see what types of intangible assets exist and are applicable in the federal government. And also to then see, get, get a sense of what um, uh, preparers thoughts were on reporting requirements that would, could be associated with them and what the benefits and difficulties would be of uh, recognizing uh, such uh, types of intangible assets. You know, some of the other standard setters have uh, existing guidance on intangible assets. We do not yet. So we, we thought it was certainly a worthwhile effort to look into it. And what came of that research was that there was a strong need for us to update our software technology or what we call our internal use software guidance. Uh, like I said, we don't have intangible asset guidance, but we do have existing software guidance. Nevertheless, uh, the main point that came from the research was that preparers were generally signaling a need to update software uh, reporting guidance. And ours is quite old. I, I think it's, uh, I want to say it's as old as the late 90s, right? And so any subject that we could talk about, probably you would think software is the one we especially need to try to keep updating and stay on top of. So that's, uh, that has led to what I call this kind of sub project of our intangible asset project, and we call it software technology. And so you can see here uh, the project scope uh, for this effort. Um, uh, four main categories, uh, cloud service arrangements, uh, that's the current name um, we are using. Uh, so call it whatever you want, cloud computing, uh, cloud arrangements, subscription-based IT arrangements, some call it hosting arrangements. Uh, it usually just has the term cloud in it, right? Um, we, we found there are some other standard setters that do have guidance on this. Uh, we have a bit of guidance in our technical release. Uh, however, uh, we, we very aware of the trend as you all are of just increasing use of cloud technology uh, in federal operations and a lot of uh, types of software assets that uh, were traditionally used as internal use software that maybe you developed uh, and implemented onto your system is moving more to these uh, types of cloud service arrangements right uh, so we want to look into and address uh, what are the best ways uh, to to account for these um, and we're at, so this is the first uh, scope category and so we're very early in the project and essentially right now I am working uh, I continue to work with the task force and working group 
uh, to we are basically right now researching the characteristics of cloud service arrangements and having discussions on do they meet our essential characteristics of assets, uh, which we'll actually be discussing in our um, our April board meeting next week. And so after that, we want to address these three other categories. We have shared services, and uh, those are services um, I think highly relate to cloud service arrangements, but they kind of um, uh, is what the name implies. They're services that agencies may share upon between one another. Uh, and then there's an internal use software category where uh, I think the primary thing that we'll look to here is um, looking for additional guidance, whether that's through um, a technical release or a standard, um, uh, looking to, to implement more guidance as it relates to agile development. A lot of the guidance was traditionally made using with the waterfall linear development in mind. Uh, but we have received a request from several um, preparers um, of a need for more guidance as it relates to agile type um, development. And then finally, other software technology we would like to um, use as a kind of a catch-all category. And this can include things like cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, robotic process automation, or anything else that may come uh, to light. Um, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay. And then the second thing that came from uh, that my intangible asset research project is that there was a lot of concern with reporting guidance other than software but uh, with creating reporting guidance for intangible assets as, as many stressed the inherent difficulties uh, of of trying to uh, record uh, and recognize asset value for uh, intangible assets that are intangible in nature um, right it, it sounds uh, difficult just saying it um, the intangible asset makes it difficult and so what the board came to is, in, is a first step rather than trying to develop guidance was to uh, come up and with and develop a working definition for intangible asset. Uh, and so that's what, I, again, I worked with a working group to do this and we presented it last uh, meeting in February. And I want to make it clear, this is a working definition and it's for the board's internal use only. Uh, so it's not authoritative in any way. But this is essentially what we came up with in the moment. Uh, a recognizable intangible asset is a resource that lacks physical substance, right? Uh, you can't touch it. It's not like PP&E or land um, or building, uh, anything like that, right? It, it lacks physical substance in nature. So you can think like, well, a patent, uh, maybe a piece of paper represents it, but the asset is intangible in nature, right? It's an idea um, or, or something of that nature. And technology or software technology also, it may come in the form or it doesn't anymore, but it could come in the form of like a CD or disk, right? But that's not the actual asset. The, it's the computer code, uh, if you will, right, is intangible in nature, okay? Uh, it doesn't represent a mon monetary asset, okay? So it lacks physical substance and it is not a monetary asset. So think of it, it doesn't relate to things like investments or currency receivables uh, or anything like that, okay? has a useful life greater than two years. That's our standard useful life criteria. Uh, it is identifiable as a separate asset from the entity. Uh, it embodies future economic benefits or services, and the entity controls it. And those last two I just said come from our concept five uh, for just general requirements of an asset, okay? And then finally, um, to be a recordable um, or recognizable asset on statements, it would need to have measurable value. So you could technically have an asset if it meets these other criteria, right? But at the end of the day, for it to be recognizable in statements, it would need to have some type of measurable value, okay? So there's more to come, um, of course, with both software and intangible assets. Um, and, and I encourage everyone to, if you're interested, join in on our board meetings or reach out to me if you would like. It's never too late to join the working group, okay? Uh, with that, we'll go on to the next slide and the next speaker. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so um, with with leases, uh, as as many of you know, uh, the board has undertaken basically a post implementation, but uh, or I'm sorry, post issuance, but pre implementation review of SFAS 54. Um, I think this is a little bit unique in the standard setting environment. A lot of a lot of standard setters will, you know, depending on the context. Uh, uh, do post implementation reviews and, and wait to see, you know, after a couple of years of implementation, how things are going. But because uh, statement 54 is is so significant of a change and because the types of federal leasing activities are so vast, um, the board decided to do 
a, a more of a proactive and responsive uh, po post issuance, but pre implementation review. And that has involved um, several sub projects. Um, and right now I'm talking about, you know, the active projects, um, but we'll, we'll go over some of the recently issued projects later. A majority of the implementation issues identified uh, during this project um, were addressed in technical release 20 and statement 60. Um, but right now we have a few outstanding implementation issues that are more uh, narrow and targeted that we're working on. And those include um, implementation issues surrounding uh, incremental borrowing rates and, and discounting of lease liabilities and assets, and, uh, lease receivables for lessors, as well as uh, reimbursable work authorizations. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with reimbursable uh, work authorizations, um, but many agencies uh, engage with GSA as customers um, and GSA as a provider in reimbursable work authorizations, uh, wherein uh, GSA uh, agrees to provide goods and services and the customer agency agrees to reimburse GSA for the cost of those goods and services. Uh, and uh, reimbursable work in the federal government can be tied to uh, just, you know, regular goods and services uh, that are accounted for under other existing uh, face tab literature, but they can also be uh, basically uh, meet the criteria of what you would call an agreement combination under statement 54, paragraph 78 and 79. And that's a situation where uh, you basically have an inseparable <laughs> reimbursable work authorization associated with an underlying lease asset. Um, and what do you do when that happens? It sounds sort of complicated. That's because it is. <laughs> so we're working on that right now. Uh, the, the, the discounting, uh, the discount rate project um, is probably going to fall into the omnibus project that we're working on right now. We're, we're going to do a second omnibus uh, to clarify and hopefully simpli simplify um, uh, discounting of lease liabilities and make it easier for folks to implement uh, paragraphs 42 and 59 of statement 54. Um, these uh, hopefully will be exposed for public comment later this year, and we are really encouraging you all to, um, to take a close look at these uh, and evaluate uh, the extent to which, you know, they're helpful or, um, you know, give us, give us your feedback on aspects that you agree with, disagree with, or, you know, other implementation issues that you might be having. You can always throw those into your comment letter um, so that staff can uh, consider those, um, although, you know, uh, from what I've, from what I understand with, with the leases task force, I, I do think we have addressed most of the leases implementation issues. We just have these handful of outstanding ones, but um, other things are bound to come up too. So we definitely encourage comment letters from from folks. Um, so just sort of keep your keep your eyes and ears open um, for uh, announcements. Hopefully, you guys are on the list serve, um, and and we'll receive those and can comment. Um, but yeah, I'll be back later to talk about some of the, the recently issued leases pronouncements. But for now, I'll uh, turn it over. Um, turn it over to the to the Dom. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. There's no better segue into public private partnerships than from a leases point of view, since sometimes they're inextricably joined at the hip. But um, just a shout out to some of you I haven't seen in years, Audrey. Debbie, John, Zoller, uh, Steve Coons, Tanisha Douglas, thank you so much for supporting our task force work. Um, special shout out to Scott Bell and uh, a student of mine, Daniel Harris. Public-private partnerships, the board has decided to take a look at phase one a little bit more closely. So what we're doing here, folks, is looking at which P3's agencies are in fact reporting or disclosing and whether or not additional guidance may be needed to clarify aspects of P3s. Now, remember, P3s you know, have been around a heck of a long time, even before the founding of the nation, really. So what is important is that these are arrangements that share risk and reward, and or reward, we should say, okay? And they are long-term in nature. So... Phase one looked to identify the population of P3s that exist in the federal space. And in this way, 
we can then address, if need be, measurement and recognition. So the board at this point has said, you know, Dom, don't go full steam ahead on measurement and recognition, okay? Um, let's focus on phase one. So for those of you who have not yet signed up or inquired, uh, I, along with the uh, P3 task force and a measurement and working group and a measurement and recognition working group, we developed a three-hour training session on SFAS 49. So if you're interested, you can let me know. But you folks are wearing me out because I'm doing like one every week, and uh, we're having a lot of interest in identifying or learning more about how to identify P3s for reporting purposes, okay? So pretty much that's what we're doing there on phase one. Phase two is kind of off into the future. I don't want to talk about it too much other than give you some, like, way out theoretical concepts like what do you measure in a P3? Is it, for example, as Alan is indicating in leases, you know, do we have a lease? And if so, do we use leases guidance? Well, the big issue there is typically in a lease, and Alan can always correct me when I'm wrong, because I'm sure to correct him when he's wrong. That's the relationship we have, but he's a great guy. Um, the issue is with leases, we convey, you know, the lessor conveys control to the lessee typically, right? So, you know, then the lessee uses the asset as they will. In the P3, even if it uses a lease, the lessor, if you will, the government, doesn't relinquish control. So there's these kinds of esoteric issues over control and ownership. And then also, is the P3 asset just what is being constructed, like a building or a piece of equipment, or is it the actual P3 arrangement, everything involved in it, including the assets and liabilities of any special purpose vehicle or entity that was created, okay? And then there are different ways of measuring, you know, um, the activity of the P3. So it gets kind of complicated. It's a little bit too much for us to talk about, but we do talk about it in our three-hour class, okay? So um, we've got a few more left. We may be able to squeeze you into some open seats to talk about that. But um, the thing here, again, is uh, our training and outreach has extended to you now, specifically in regards to SFAS 49. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to call me and then we'll decide if you need to submit a technical inquiry, okay? But with that said, I think I've said enough about P3s. I'll be talking more about them until probably God knows when. But I want to just uh, shout out to all of you and thank you for participating. It's been a long time. Back over to the sponsors of this great show. Bye. All right. Thank you, Dom. Um, yes, I, I, just to pick up on what Dom said, um, I, I would encourage you to um, you know, wherever you can uh, have an opportunity to um, take Dom's class on on P3s, um, as well as the leases. Both of those projects are, are uh, well, I should say the issues are, are, are rather complex, and um, uh, both of them have done a, a fabulous job in, in outreach and training uh, to ensure that the community um, has a full understanding uh, of our guidance, and um, that's that is very important uh, to uh, to FaceAB as a whole. All right, so I'm going to <clears throat> talk a little bit about uh, one of our newer projects, uh, but uh, I'm sure you're going to be hearing about this project for quite some time: reexamination of existing standards. Um, so this project is, is as I said, um, new. Um, the board um, just recently put it on its technical agenda. Uh, this project is going to be uh, labor intensive and, and will take uh, quite some time. Uh, so initially, um, well, let me back up. So the, the project is really in its initial research phase. And, and at that point, Staff um, is performing an assessment of existing standards and developing options for the board to consider. And, and that will give us an idea just how do we 
you know, uh, approach this project? You know, do we start with one and <laughs> and go through 60? Uh, you know, do you do it by topic? So there are many different ways uh, that the that the board um, uh, is going to be considering uh, how to take on that project. But in the in the early stages, uh, we are going to be uh, involving the community. So I'll talk a little bit about that in in the next slide. But um, some of the um, areas that we want to address, um, uh, we want to look at any inconsistencies in in the in the current practices. Uh, I think Josh talked about the software, uh, our software guidance, and that. You know, I think uh, Statement 10 dates back to uh, the, the mid-90s. So, of course, there, the changes in technology are, are extensive. So, you know, we want to look for any inconsistencies or, or where uh, current practices or, or those prior practices have been, uh, been changed. You know, where there are any uh, confusion or difficulties in applying the requirements. Um, we're, we're going to be looking at that uh, and, and the need for clarification. Um, we also, the board really wants to look at the usefulness of, of the disclosures and other required information. Are the um, uh, note disclosures, are they too uh, cumbersome? You know, where can they be combined? Where, where are they no longer needed? So those are some of the, um, some of the areas we're going to be um, looking into, you know, looking at terminology, um, as I said, uh, considering the needs of, uh, of the users, and, and also assessing the cost benefits uh, of, of the guidance. So all of that will be part of what um, we will be looking at um, as we move forward uh, in this project. Next slide. All right, so the first step that the, that the board is going to take um, will be in a um, invitation to comment. So uh, in that, um, in that uh, uh, publication, um, the, the board will talk about some of the, well, well really it'll be more asking questions. The board will be asking questions uh, about how to approach it. You know, are there issues with um, the gap hierarchy? Um, how, do, how should we approach the uh, reexamination uh, project, um, as I kind of talked about uh, a little earlier, as well as, uh, you know, should we move towards uh, to a codification? You know, many of the other standard setters have some form of, of codification, uh, FASB, uh, GASB, ISB, um, uh, although they also have something, I, I think we learned that ISB, ISB has something similar to what we currently have, our, our handbook. So we want to um, make the standards um, useful uh, um, as well as, you know, accessible. You know, is it cumbersome to use the handbook? We've been using the handbook for, for many years. You know, a lot of people like it, you know, uh, but there are some who would like to see it, you know, more in a, in a codification. So there may be some, you know, some hybrid uh, that we will be able to um, create that will be um, uh, kind of mesh the codification and the, uh, <laughs> the handbook format. Um, together. So, um, so look out for, uh, for that, uh, that project. And, and as we develop the invitation to comment, we are going to be reaching out to various groups, uh, the CFO Council, uh, there's a couple treasury groups that we're going to be um, looking to, as well as the audit community, to help us put that invitation to comment uh, publication together, uh, so that um, we will we can ask the the right questions um, to get the best feedback um, from the community. So, all right. So that will take us to our third polling question. All right. And I'll be launching this third polling question. 
and it should be up on everyone's screen momentarily. Okay, and and so we heard that the because there are so many people on um, um, attending this session, we sh we are going to give a little more time for the polling questions. Um, we will give some leeway on those first two questions uh, for people who who may not have um, had time to um, put their answers in. So we'll give a little more time this time because there are, as I said, there are so many. This has certainly been a learning experience since this is our very first virtual annual update. So, um, you know, we're used <laughs> to in the audience that, that. we are learning lots. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it absolutely has been a, a, a learning uh, learning experience. So, and, um, you know, and, and we're glad to see that there are so many people interested in um, in participating and and listening in uh, in the session. Hey, Monica, can I add to uh, some of your talking points on the um, reexamination? Re real quick, sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted I just wanted to point out just so that everybody sort of knows how everything fits together. That yeah, and uh, Monica alluded to it too. There there. There are already activities that we're doing that are in substance reexaminations, like what Josh's project is doing. I guess my project is reexamining leases um, in some respects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Sherry Lee is doing some uh, early research uh, exam reexamining uh, state, I think it's statement 38, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so there's art, but the I think what what the board is doing is, you know, looking ahead at sort of like the next steps and like the longer term plan for reexamining. And I just wanted to reemphasize the, the the need to have sort of a feedback loop with the community and, you know, encourage folks to respond to the preliminary views and help us uh, determine, you know, where are the priorities or where, where are you getting tripped up and, um, and you know, really encourage you to uh, take a look. Once it comes out, I don't, I don't know that you're necessarily close to releasing a, a preliminary views yet. Also, I think I might be answering the polling question and cheating a little bit, but sorry about that. <laughs> well, no, you're actually giving the wrong answer. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, so, so yeah. I, I know what the answer is now, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so so Alan is Alan is uh, absolutely correct. Yeah, there are many efforts that are currently going on. Um, and as I said, uh, this this project is going to uh, be a long term project. Um, Melissa Bachelor, one of our assistant directors, is uh, working on uh, putting together that invitation to comment. But as Alan said, it is going to be very important to get the um, input from from the community because. You know, um, that's where we'll we'll know where we should where the board should concentrate uh, its efforts. So um, when you when you see it come out, we'll do everything we can to to publicize it. But uh, please do um, give us your feedback. Give us your feedback. So okay, uh, let's see. We're up to ninety two percent, and I don't see any more. Uh, responses being given. So I think we've given given enough time. So we'll go ahead and close that poll and, and share the results. Everyone should see the results on their screens now. Yes. Yes. The, uh, Alan kind of threw in that preliminary views, uh, giving folks the, the wrong answer. But Again, this is not a, a right or wrong, and and actually all of these uh, uh, responses can be correct because at this point uh, it it could go through all of these different uh, um, uh, vehicles uh, that um, the board may use. So, <laughs> you know, invitation to comment, and then it could go to preliminary views and exposure draft. So, um, all right. So Thank we'll you, go ahead well and. While I get Don put oh. up on this slide, can you please record the results of that polling question? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Dom, uh, we'll turn it over to Dom to talk about one of our um, non-controversial co topics. 
land. <laughs> Thanks, Very Tom. non-controversial. Thank you, Monica. Um, anyhow, land, accounting for land, um, you know, this began uh, approximately uh, 10 years ago, and it was an outgrowth from work done at the Department of Defense. And the board, what it did here in retrospect, when you go back and look at this, um, FaceApp doesn't get enough credit, nor, you know, um, you know, for its work. You know, when you think about the fine work that I alluded to under our former director, Ms. Payne, and the prior boards, whether it was fiscal sustainability, um, you know, social insurance, um, deferred maintenance, our board really has been cutting edge. And um, I could say something about leases, but I won't. But regardless of leases, um, land is another example of where the board has gone bold, right? And it's introducing non-financial information. And really, it hasn't really introduced it. It's reintroduced it because Standard 29 on heritage assets and stewardship land kind of focused, really did, on non-financial measurements, if you will. We called them physical units in Standard 29. So what the board has basically done here um, is address a controversial topic of removing general property plant equipment land from the balance sheet in exchange for re reporting of acreage. And um, we received a lot of feedback, and the major land holding agencies naturally were concerned, and rightfully so. There were preparer issues. There were also um, auditor concerns. So what the board has done has said, look, we hear you. We are just not here going to set standards in a vacuum. We're going to evaluate standard 59 over four-year RSI period. So yes, the standard is affected. Yes, the land holding agencies and auditors must begin work this fiscal year. Both preparer issues and auditor issues during this four year period, RSI period. And then the board in fiscal year 25 will reassess whether or not changes need to be made or additional guidance needs to be issued, and whether or not they want to, in fact, go forward with the removal of gpp and &E land from the balance sheet. Um, some of you may say, wow, this is weird. This is not accounting. Um, I hear you. It is different. But please understand where, you know, if financial reporting is to remain relevant, it must address topics that some of us might believe are outside the remit of accounting. For example, the work Robin, fine work Robin has done with, um, you know, uh, accounting for weather-related events. So that is something that we have to address. If we're going to stay relevant, we have to look at non-financial information. So we understand the issues there. Um, but addressing some of the problems uh, with land uh, is that, um, you know, we had different reporting for GPP land and stewardship land. And the board decided, and actually it was a Department of Treasury um, suggestion that we simplify the accounting over land. And um, the board decided, well, there should be pretty much one way to account for land. It shows NFI, folks, because the business users or the citizens on the task force wanted fair value, and they wanted land broken down by parcel. Well, you know, that's impossible, okay? We don't have the technology to fly at the speed of light yet, so we can't do that. So they settled upon, if you will, the task force and opening the board on acreage. Now, GPP 
and e-land and stewardship land were predicated on the intended use of land at the time the land was acquired, okay? So we go out and we buy a piece of land and we intend to maybe use it to build a home. But if later we decide to use it for, you know, a garden or an arboretum, we've changed its use. The purpose still remained, right? The, you know, the title, the deed all said that it was going to be basically zoned, let's say, to be have a house built on it. So the problem is, is that Congress, both aisles, uh, or both sides of the aisles, want to know land use information. So the standard had to address that. So what we do now is we retain the classifications of gpp and &E land and stewardship land. However, we've developed three subcategories to report the actual use of that land. And it's got to be based on predominant use, okay? So you've got naturally conservation and preservation land, so your national parks would probably all wind up there, at least most of them. Forest service would wind up there. Then you have operational land, you know, the acreage that the HUD building sits on and the Department of Agriculture, that would be operational land. And um, then we have the um, commercial use land. So, and that would be, you know, for land that we've um, predominantly used during the year to generate revenue. So those three categories um, would show the use of the land. Now, two important points. The board does not want acreage reported. You hear me? They do not want acreage reported. They want estimated acreage to be reported. So to all my auditor friends out there, put your little micron rulers away. The board intends for estimates to be naturally deviations to certain degrees but the board is not seeking precision. The other thing, of multi-use land. Look at your multi-use, look at your land management plans and determine what is the predominant use. Now, the board has been very kind, I think, and very professional in listening to all of these arguments and responding to each and every one in a very coherent manner. The board also allows you, as a preparer, to aggregate your congressional district in the way that you get the most votes, okay? That's my metaphor. You can aggregate land in a way to kind of show the predominant use of that land. So the acreage may not all be contiguous in a certain national park or forest um, reserve, you could draw whatever boundary or zone to show the predominant use of that non-contiguous land, if you will. So the board has provided extreme flexibility. And uh, with that being said, again, any questions on land, call me. And if we need to, we can provide uh, training have a meeting, or even do a technical inquiry. But thank you very much. Thank you, Dom. Speaking of speaking of land and P3s, Dom, I know, um, and, and you know as well, there's a lot of interactions uh, between leases and P3s, as Dom has mentioned, and, as well as land. Um, and so, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of the technical inquiries that we're probably anticipating over the next three or four years uh, will have those interactions and, and some of the more significant technical inquiries that you guys might submit. Uh, you know, Dom and I often work together on those. Um, so shout out to Dom and all the times he corrects me. Um, I'll try not to make any more errors during this presentation. Um, so th this is just the big picture slide. I think a lot of you in the audience have sort of seen this before, but you know, for the benefit of, of everyone, um, I just like to show this to uh, give you sort of a high level. Um, right now, everybody's uh, you know 
most of your lease lease balances are off balance sheet um, right now um, under um, AFC 840. Um, statement 54 becomes effective in fiscal year 2024. And the board uh, decided to bring uh, lease assets and lease liabilities onto the balance sheet for um, lease, lease transactions with the public. So that when we um, consolidate and roll up everything to the uh, consolidated financial report of the US government, um, we have a complete picture of, of lease balances uh, on the consolidated balance sheet. But the board decided to, um, you know, for leases that are two years or less, or for intergovernmental leases, which would ultimately get eliminated during consolidation anyway, uh, there, there are still accounting rules in State 54 for those types of leases. And some of the short term payable and receivable balances are still required to show up on the balance sheet. But the long term lease asset and lease liability accounting for such leases uh, is exempted by the board in Statement 54. Um, so, one, sort of one common error that folks will often mention to me when they submit technical inquiries or ask me questions is, you know, they they think that because all of their leases are intergovernmental that they're exempted from SFAS 54. Um, they're not really exempted from SFAS 54. They're exempted from the the section of SFAS 54 for lease assets and lease liabilities, but SFAS 54 addresses uh, leases uh, comprehensively and there's different sections for different types of leases. Uh, so I'd just like to remind folks of that during trainings, um, your, your lease accounting for every type of lease is, is changing on some level um, because SFAS 54 is, is a new statement um, addressing each type of lease. Um, and, you know, just the big, you know, the big picture overall for this slide, though, and the big takeaway is that, you know, more leasing activity uh, will be showing up on the balance sheet, particularly for, for entities um, like, uh, you know, what we're expecting to see is, you know, um, this will have a significant uh, effect on the balance sheet of the General Services Administration, uh, the Department of the Interior, probably the Department of Energy, um, DOD, um, the Department of State. Um, as well as other uh, reporting entities too. But those are just some examples of entities that have significant lease portfolios. Um, you can go to the next slide. So just gonna give you guys a high level. I, I know that, you know, about half of this audience has heard some of this stuff before, but, um, you know, at a high level, lessees with, we're talking about leases with the public too. Are, they're required to recognize a lease liability and lease asset at the commencement of the lease term, okay? And the measurement basis for this is basically a present value of future um, payments expected to be made uh, during the lease term. Um, these are usually fixed in nature. Uh, variable payments are excluded from the lease liability oftentimes. Um, obviously, you would go to SFAS 54 for more specific uh, guidance on that. And then there's this sort of mirroring that happens with leases. Uh, this And this is consistent across FASB, GASB, as well as FASAB. The, the overall approaches of these boards are uh, similar. Um, you know, lessors will recognize a lease receivable and um, unearned revenue at the commencement of a lease term. And that's the present value of future receipts expected to be received during the lease term. Um, and then obviously, you know, like I talked about earlier, we, we have the exemption for uh, short-term leases and intergovernmental leases, which have their own sections in Statement 54. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so these are the two major um, implementation complexities that, that I see over and over again when working with the leases task force and engaging with the community. And they're really more sort of fundamental, judgmental types of issues. Um, the first one is the definition of a lease. Um, so, you know, let's just go over it. I know some of you've heard this before, but in a lease, this and this is consistent with the GASB and FASB framework too, in general. But um, you have a contractor agreement whereby one entity um, conveys the right to uh, control the use of an underlying asset. In this case, the board defined underlying asset as PP&E, 
Um, it gets a little bit more complicated if the under, if you think you have a lease and the underlying asset might not meet the definition of PPE, and I can talk about that here in a minute. Um, to another entity for a period of time, as specified in the contract or agreement, in exchange for consideration. Um, so this is my first plug, I guess, for the technical release twenty. Um, a lot of definitional questions can come up as you're going through uh, this definition. Um, so, for example, the con control. There's a lot of questions about that. There's a lot of questions about sort of what happens if it's not doesn't really meet the definition of PP&E, or what happens if the period, uh, you know, for periods of time that are indefinite or unspecified or um, basically forever. <laughs> um, what happens in those situations? Um, and then what happens if the, the um, right to control is only for a certain type of use? So for example, you might uh, have an easement for, um, for grading rights, or you could have underground uh, pipes that go through a, a property. Is that, does that still meet the definition of a lease when you don't control other aspects of the, the land, um, the underlying asset? Um, so a lot of these questions are answered in Technical Release 20. Um, technical Release 20 um, was really designed based, uh, a lot of it was based on uh, Gatsby's implementation guidance, but some of it um, was based on, you know, the unique federal environment that we're in and uh, questions that came up among a task force of over 100 or 120 people. Um, so the AAPC and the task force um, did an outstanding job with this. Um, I couldn't have you know, managed the project without over 100 people helping me. Um, and so really I like to point folks to Technical Release 20 is really the first place to go to when these types of questions come up. Um, and then you know when you have lease definitions that, um, you know, sort of, you're going to, you're going to run into implementation challenges, especially with embedded leases. Um, and, you know, the first place that we would really want you to go is technical release 20, you know, take a look at the definition section and then take a look at the, the multi-component contract uh, section of the technical release. The technical release is organized by topic area for navigability. Um, and you would just sort of read that in tandem with statement 54 to try to figure out the answer to your question and or at least your preliminary answer and then you can always you know submit a technical inquiry if it's unusually complex um, but in addition to the lease definition uh, issues that you can sort of encounter with statement 54 um, lease term is really the significant factor in my opinion or perhaps the only factor really that ends up resulting in lease liabilities and lease assets being estimates. Um, at the end of the day, you're, there's going to be, you know, guidance on the discounting, there's going to be guidance on, you know, there's guidance to do the present value of the ca the future cash flows, inflows or outflows, depending on if you're lessee or lessor. So all of that is sort of just very mechanical, and sort of, you, there's not a lot of uh, practitioner judgment involved. But Lease term involves significant judgment and management assessments and, and judgment. So um, a lease term is basically your non-cancelable period in the lease contract or agreement, plus certain periods subject to options to extend or terminate. Um, when you're assessing your own options, you're basing it on probability. Um, so if it's more likely than not, you would normally include that period in, in your lease term estimate. Um, if it, once it becomes um, more unlikely than, than likely, um, then you would exclude it from your lease term. Uh, but it becomes a little bit more challenging when you're assessing the counterparty's options, right? Because you're not them. You can't really assess their probability. So the board decided to have a, more of an evidence-based assessment for lease term. Um, and the guidance you know, sh shows up there. And if you have significant evidence, uh, there's, there's some factors to consider as well in the lease term definition. Um, and then there's also some specific, uh, other specific provisions that you need to consider when assessing uh, periods subject to options to terminate. Um, so um, for example, if, uh, 
if both parties have to agree to extend or not terminate uh, during a certain period or at a certain point along the way in the future, uh, that's considered a, a cancelable period uh, under paragraph 19B, I think, or 19A, I can't remember. Um, and under those situations, you'd exclude it from the lease term. So the lease term is an eight paragraph long definition that involves you know, a lot of management judgments. And all of this really affects the window of cash flows that you're going to be discounting back. Um, so it's a significant factor in the lease liability and lease asset estimates um, and something that you'll you know, want to have sort of robust policies and procedures that you consistently follow um, when you're implementing this uh, statement 54. And then you also have to you know, sort of assess um, you know, remeasurement and when to reevaluate the lease term. So there's a lot of moving parts and interactions in statement 54 that need to be considered um, in advance. And um, one of the things I'm really doing um, too is, you know, trying to get people sort of <laughs> accounting ready and audit ready. Um, so there's, there's really a lot that the auditor might be looking for here, especially if you have a significant lease portfolio and the groundwork needs to be sort of already happening or happening right now to figure out, you know, what types of evidence uh, you're going to be able to uh, provide your auditor if a, a lease transaction is selected for testing. So um, I really want folks to really be thinking about having robust sort of policies and procedures and controls around, uh, you know, identifying embedded leases, uh, you know, making sure that your, um, your, process is consistent with the definition of a lease as well as uh, the lease term. Um, so that's, those are really areas where I'm seeing the, the sort of the biggest um, risks, if you will. Um, Lee, I can't remember if I have another slide or not. I have a couple more things I want to say, but I don't remember what my slides look like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So um, these are the two pronouncements. I've already talked about technical release 20, uh, but for those of you a little bit less familiar, I'll take a step back here and just say that technical release 20 is in uh, question and answer format. Um, and it's organized, like I said earlier, by topic area that sort of crosswalks to uh, statement 54. Um, you'll, um, you should have a pretty e easy time navigating your questions, but like I said earlier, some so there's a lot of interactions within statement 54 and you have to consider multiple topic areas simultaneously. So that's a consideration when you're navigating technical release 20 and trying to research your answer, you might need to check in two locations, potentially in certain cases, but uh, technical release 20 uh, addresses a lot of the implementation challenges in, in the federal environment. Um, another aspect of the post issuance activities um, undertaken by the board is sort of proactively and responsively looking at, uh, you know, while we're doing all this implementation monitoring and coming up with Q&A, why not at the same time, uh, you know, in tandem with that, figure out where we can clarify certain aspects of Statement 54. So um, Statement 60 uh, amends Statement 54, and um, I think there's about 30 or 35 amendments uh, in Statement 60, which on the surface, it sounds like a rewrite, but it's really not. Uh, statement 54 held together really nicely, but there's a lot of technical clarifications that were helpful that we identified on the task force and on the AAPC that show up in there and that should uh, facilitate a more cost-effective um, implementation and, and audits. Um, you know, we don't want uh, a lot of auditor and auditee uh, interpret interpretive uh, disagreements when implementation is happening. Uh, obviously, there's enough cost to deal with with dealing with Statement 54, and uh, the board was mindful of, of these costs. Um, so then the other aspect of sort of uh, post-issuance review is looking at the cost benefit when, when things came up with implementation challenges. Um, maybe we could make some targeted cost benefit decisions and targeted rescissions um, if it became, you know, sort of absolutely clear that it was necessary and it was clear that something wasn't going to work. So if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't remember the count off the top of my head, but there are two or three uh, disclosure or requirement uh, rescissions that are relatively narrow 
that should greatly reduce the cost of implementation. Uh, it doesn't really uh, fundamentally change uh, Statement 54 that much, um, but it's just sort of simplifying some of the intergovernmental and short-term leases requirements. And uh, I think we rescinded one or two uh, disclosure requirements that we figured out were really uh, not, they weren't really gonna be reportable um, because of uh, system limitations and the resulting information wasn't gonna necessarily meet the qual qualitative characteristics uh, that, that Monica alluded to um, earlier in the presentation. So statement 60 is out there. Um, and then just to remind you all, we have two additional pronouncements under due, due process right now. Um, we have another omnibus where we're looking at a few more things that were left out of statement 60. Um, and then we're looking at uh, reimbursable work authorizations. Uh, and that is still TBD, but we uh, staff thinks that that can be done through a technical bulletin. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of keep an eye on that. Um, the April board meeting materials for those of you that are interested or may want to become involved either through the commenting process or just more informally um, or something you definitely would want to take a look at. Uh, topic, it's topic B. And obviously, you know, the briefing materials are, are posted um, online. So um, that's all I wanted to say for that. And then the last sort of hopefully the last step of post issuance activities will be we will have to make conforming amendments to technical release 20 after these next two pronouncements come out. Um, so the AAPC will reconvene either probably in August or November of this year to get started on that, um, but there's a lot of variables at play. It could you know, be a little bit sooner or a little bit later. Um, but you know, just sort of keep an eye on the, the interactions between technical release 20 and, uh, and these uh, changes that are coming um, because we can expand on and tweak uh, technical release 20 once those, ish, uh, once those pronouncements become finalized. And then uh, the, the last thing, the last plug I wanted to add, I guess I got two more minutes, right? <laughs> Um, is that we're going to do some, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of outreach and training with leases. Reach out to me um, if, if you're interested. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of, of a plug for the GAO SIGI conference and get, uh, I know that I think auditors are like 30 or 40% of the attendees here. So, you know, keep an eye out for the GAO SIGI announcements and, and sign up for that. I think we've uh, got a great session in store for this year. And we're actually going to talk about um, materiality and applying materiality concepts and requirements in the context of leases, which gets extremely complicated um, and another judgmental thing in nature that'll be fun to talk about. And we have uh, Mr. Dacey, the chief accountant of GAO, as well as uh, Mr. Showalter, the former board's chairman, um, and um, Christy Dewhurst from GSA um, speaking at that, I believe. So that'll be a great panel and we, we hope you guys can attend that. Um, but we'll you know, be doing other trainings too for the preparers on the line. And we can, we're also doing more one-on-one, -on -one, especially with larger preparers with significant lease portfolios. If, if you guys are interested, just uh, let me know. I'll squeeze you in where, where I can. Um, I think we have a polling question now. Yes, I will launch the polling question. Okay, which of the following attributes does not describe a lease as defined by Statement 54? Let's see if you know the answer. And Alan, I think it's really neat. Um, I don't think you noted it when you were talking about SF60 and TR20, but that that was the first time that SAFAB has issued a joint exposure draft, which certainly saved time for respondents, I'm sure. And that was a really neat, neat thing for the board to do for the first time. Right. Yeah, we, I think the, the board and staff tried to step into the shoes of the respondents to the exposure draft. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I don't think... Uh, you know, folks got enough to deal with with uh, implementing leases, and we were like, well, you know, we can expose these things in tandem and probably get better comment letters because they'll have to read both of them at the same time and the interactions between the two, as well as, uh, you know, it's much more preferable to write one comment letter as opposed to two. <laughs> 
and those those were hugely helpful. I want to give a, a shout out to all, all the folks um, that that provided comments on that. It was um, very helpful to the due process uh, for for technical release twenty and statement sixty, as well as statement fifty eight when we decided to defer for three years. Those comments were helpful too. Let me let me walk right, through this. Uh, let me walk through the answers, Leah, um, just to yeah, uh, sure. reinforce the definition for folks. Um, we're well, we're looking for which of the following attributes does not describe a lease. In in a lease, uh, you do uh, have the right to derive economic benefits and services from use of the underlying assets. So that one is correct. Uh, that is an attribute. It's not the correct answer. Um, Leases must be for a period of time, and that period of time in the lease term would include certain periods subject to termination or renewal options. Um, and I, we went over that, so I'm pretty sure not very many people will select that one. Um, lease assets are not PP&E. Um, the underlying asset to a lease is the PP&E. So that is the uh, correct answer. It's not an attribute of a lease because the underlying asset is the PP&E rather than the lease asset. Uh, the lease asset is more intangible in nature. Um, and then lastly, uh, consideration, when you're thinking about the definition of a lease, um, consideration is one of those elements. Consideration can be non-monetary or uh, monetary. Um, and I think, I think we have a Q&A in the technical release to address that. I don't think it probably happens very often in the federal environment when, when you would have non-monetary considerations, but if you consider the por portfolio of the federal environment, the lease portfolio, I'm sure that there's at least a few out there um, where there's some non-monetary consideration. Um, so oh, Alan, that one. Is, yeah, I, yeah, Alan, this is Dom. Just on the non-monetary piece, we do see it in these enhanced use leases. And uh, in particular, I know uh, the task force identified that the VA had, in fact, um, when it extended their Cleveland Medical Center, their enhanced use lease, in fact, had significant amounts of non-monetary. So, again, okay. leases, P3s, you know, you got to really be careful, folks. A plain vanilla P3, Allen's right, probably wouldn't include the non-monetary or in-kind donation or contribution. But that same plain vanilla lease bundled into a P3 is going to be rock and rolling and smoking with stuff. And that's where you're going to have to really separate the wheat from the chaff and you, I'm sure you're loving these metaphors, but back to you, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so that just sort of reinforces that there are exceptions. Uh, I'll be, it'll be interesting to find out sort of how common they are, but, and then there's some more Q&A too about, you know, one of the, uh, the differences between uh, leases in the federal environment and GASB 87 is that the board included consideration as the element rather than exchange-like. So you don't have to provide, it doesn't have to be like full consideration. If you have a lease for like $100 and it's sort of ridiculous what the rental rate is for the federal government, um, that can still meet the definition of a lease because that is still consideration. It doesn't have to be necessarily full consideration. Um, so the technical release talks about that too. Alan, it's looking like we have 90% of folks who okay. have answered, so I'm going to end the poll and then share the results. And folks should see the results on their screens now. That's actually pretty good. I think folks question. are, well, folks are getting better at it though, because I've asked this question in some form or fashion <laughs> over the last three years at different trainings and folks are slowly getting better at it. I take a lot of pride in uh, the high rate of incorrect answers that I like to ask because I like to trick people, but it's, uh, it's getting better. So that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen or I'm sorry, stop sharing the polling results. And now it looks like we're going to be headed to for a 10 minute break. And since it is 1036, we'll ask that folks are back at their computers and ready to continue at 1046. So 1046, please be back. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back everyone. It is now 1046 and 
I have the job of getting us back on track uh, as far as timing. Um, oh, let me turn my camera back on. Uh, Leah and Josh are running an extremely tight time ship, and I am going to get us do my best to get us back on track. So, so these next two um, pronouncements that I wanted to talk about are, are two interpretations. They are very narrow in scope, and um, they these are um, uh, topics that came out of uh, technical inquiries. Um, so this just shows you that the, the importance of technical inquiries, you know, when there are questions, I apologize for that <laughs> ringing. Um, uh, but as I said, you know, when we have technical inquiries and they cannot be answered specifically by staff, where there's a, a need for an interpretation or technical bulletin or, or some other pronouncement, um, you know, staff will turn it over to the board and, and make recommendations there. And so these are two. Uh, our two last interpretations uh, are, are exactly that. Interpretation 10 on clarification of non-federal, non-entity uh, fund balance with treasury classification. Uh, it's an interpretation of uh, standards one, uh, paragraph uh, 31, and uh, standard 31. So there were some changes made in, uh, in uh, amendments in um, standard 31 that affected standard one and caused some confusion. So we had a couple stakeholders reach out to us and ask for clarification. So um, if you if you think that standard um, or, or that guidance is um, applicable to you, please read through it. And um, if you have any questions, reach out to us. All right, next, uh, next slide on interpretation number 10. Again, this is another one that um, is a result of a, of a technical inquiry that dealt with um, uh, an issue, uh, an audit issue. You know, there were some audit questions raised, um, some questions raised um, during audit and as far as the uh, accounting treatment for debt cancellation. So um, staff, well, worked with the with the parties and uh, that were involved in this particular issue, and um, the result was was an interpretation, um, an interpretation to uh, standard seven, paragraph three thirteen. So again, if this um, you know if this particular issue uh, is applicable to you, be sure to uh, take a look at it, and if you have any questions. Uh, make sure you uh, reach out to us. So um, that's all I'll say on those. Uh, I don't think I saved a whole lot of time, but uh, now I will turn it over to Sherry. Uh, Sherry is uh, our newest FaceFab uh, staff member. Sherry? Sherry, you might be on mute. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Monica. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk about how you can get involved uh, in the standard setting process. Um, you can get involved through collaboration, education, and outreach. Next slide, please. So this chart illustrates the circular and back and forth dynamic. Uh, between FaceApp and stakeholders throughout the whole process. Um, on the um, upper right, uh, the project starts with research. So in this phase, uh, FaceApp may hold four educational sessions, meet with other standard setters uh, such as GASB or FASB. Uh, we may hold roundtables or conduct surveys. Now, moving to the development phase, uh, FaceApp collaborates with other standard setters, uh, form uh, task forces and working groups, and develop and issue exposure draft uh, to stakeholders for comments in this uh, phase. Now, during the finalization phase, 
uh, physically reach out to stakeholders for clarification, discussion, or the comments that we received. Um, and we, we may hold uh, public hearings. Now, at this point, um, the face up um, interaction with stakeholders continues after the standard is issued. So after the standard is issued, FACEP may set up implementation working groups or task forces to address implementation challenges. Um, and to continue the interaction, uh, FACEP holds annual updates, uh, such as this one, to provide stakeholders project updates. And we also hold educational briefings um, give professional organization presentations such as um, in the AGA luncheon or AGA chapter training. Um, the, we also have staff liaison uh, to government working groups, uh, including USSGL, uh, AGA, uh, and the inspector uh, group. I'm not sure these are all, but we, we, we are heavily involved in government-wide working groups. Um, we also respond to technical inquiries submitted by stakeholders, and we may conduct workshops and training uh, if needed. And so the uh, interactions are ongoing. So how do you get involved in, in the whole process? Uh, you may get involved by providing uh, your comments to the uh, three-year plan, or you may join working groups and task forces um, to, to and provide your comments to the um, survey um, and also attend board meetings either in person or virtual. The, the virtual option is very convenient. Uh, you don't need to leave your workstation. So it is um, a, a vital part of, of the, you know, during the pandemic. And also when the exposure drafts are uh, issued uh, for comments. Uh, this is really important that you uh, review the exposure draft and identify any issues and provide your comments um, to face that. So basically, the more stakeholders get involved, um, the better the final product. And we, we really value your, your feedback. And uh, we do address every single one of them. We, we, not, we may not adopt every single one, but we really do um, take uh, all the uh, comments seriously. So please get involved, and so we will uh, have a better product. Okay, thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much, Sherry. It's, it's really exciting to have you here for our first virtual annual update, and so a big welcome to you. I think Sherry really explained from top to bottom how stakeholder input is integral to FaceApp's success. And we certainly, as you can hear from all of um, my fellow presenters, you can tell that we, we want to hear from you all early and often because it is really helpful to improve FaceApp's products. And so one of the ways that we would like to hear from you is through submitting technical inquiries. This is something that uh, various presenters have talked about today. And so I just want to give a little bit more background information for anyone who still might be a little bit unsure exactly what these technical inquiries are. So essentially, a technical inquiry, there is a form submission on our website that details exactly how we can help you with a technical inquiry and who we help. And this is essentially if you have a question about existing gap. If you are not exactly sure how to apply a requirement or if you want some clarification, see there's a series of questions that we'll have you answer on our website. And then from there, we have a really extensive process of review, uh, just so you can get a little bit more information of how we handle it once we receive your technical inquiry. A staff member is assigned your question, researches, and then provides their answer. Then there is a peer review process, and then Monica, our executive director, has the final review. So we really want to give you thorough, solid quality information, and that is one of the ways that we do it. So again, we encourage anyone and everyone to submit a technical inquiry if you have a question about our existing gap. 
This is also really helpful to kind of get a feel for problems that are occurring throughout the community because maybe there is no existing gap currently for your problem and this is a question that needs to be submitted to the board for a full deliberation. So again, this is a really important tool for us to be able to hear from the community and really help you and uh, assess the problems that are out there. And then I'm going to try to go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. Thank you for everyone for uh, bearing with me as I am trying to get used to the, the Zoom webinar uh, settings. Uh, and so lastly, really quickly, I wanted to give a plug for our website. As we've all said, it's really important and we would love to stay connected with you all. And an easy way to do that is to sign up for our listserv. There are 678 of you on this webinar and I hope that all 678 of you are subscribed to our listserv. If not, it's very easy. You can go to our homepage at facab.gov and in the right column that says connect with us, you can see that link right underneath that says subscribe to our listserv. And this is a very easy way to stay up to date with FaceApp's activities because we're not going to spam you every day. We're going to send out a listserv message when there are announcements for a task force being formed or when there is a news release or an exposure draft goes out if there's a final issuance that has been released. And so this is really the easiest way to stay up to date and involved with FaceApp's processes. And then I also just wanna say that our website is a great resource in general. You can see that we have a ton of our outreach products. Um, Robin was recently on HA's Accountability Talks podcast, so we have that link on the homepage, as well as various other uh, outreach products. Uh, we also have our board briefing materials I'll take this time to give a plug for our board meeting next week. We would love if you could join us and get involved in any way. As um, Alan and Robin talked about, uh, they'll have various sessions throughout the day. And so if you go to our website and click this link right on the homepage titled Board Briefing Materials, you can see all of the briefing materials and the agenda and um, you can participate for whichever sessions you would like to um, sign on for. And so I think I want to keep it quick so we can kind of get back on track, like Monica said, for timing wise. But I think we're now going to go into a Q&A session. So once again, really quickly, go to our website. We also have an email, facefab at facefab.gov. And with that, we will go into a Q&A session, which I'm going to try to moderate. Um, so. Everyone feel free to submit Q&As through the uh, Q&A portal on Zoom right now. Uh, we, you should have the ability to upvote. Um, and then we can sort of field any questions that you all may have. And FaceApp staff, my computer might be a little slow. So if you see a question that you think would be a good one to answer, please jump right in. Hi, Leah. Well, Leah, this is Dom. I've answered a few that dealt with uh, C3s or land, so I think they were, you know, placed in the dismissed column, you know, or the answered column. Okay, perfect, perfect. I see one for MDNA, Leah. Um, will the performance discussion of MDNA be expected to go away? The answer is no. In fact, we, they want more discussion about performance, but not as related to GIPRA. So we're looking at ways to, the board is looking at ways to discuss performance in relation to cost and what are you getting in relation funding wise and resources wise in relation to what you are um, results are your challenges and your accomplishments. So no, um, to answer that question. All right, great. Yeah, there was a question, Leah, that um, the audience might be interested in that was posed in the Q&A that I answered. Uh, it was about the apparent inconsistencies between OMB Circular A11 and FaceApp guidance. And um, the response there is you would expect inconsistencies and there should be inconsistencies. Uh, that's because ONBA 11 deals with the budgetary accounting flows that are required to develop 
both congressional and presidential budgets, the way we do budgets in, in governmental accountings, basically following modified accrual or cash-based type accounting. That differs from financial accounting, which focuses on the economic flow of resources, which is what FASAB does, right? We set the accrual accounting standards. So you should definitely see differences. Now, in some cases, there'll be some similarities. There was, like in the case of leases, uh, there may be some in the area, of course, in um, federal credit reform. But by and large, you should expect differences. And just cause, because we get this question a lot of time, and even one of our board members, Dr. Granoff, would say that even investigative journalists and others covering the federal government and state and local governments would always conflate budgetary accounting with financial accounting. So try to avoid that conflation, but thank you. Thank you, Dom. I see a question that has come in that Alan would like to answer, so I'll just read the question really quickly. Does FSAS 54 apply to software subscriptions? If not, where should we turn for guidance? Alan? Uh, the, the, sh the short answer, I, I, I'll work with Josh to answer this question because I don't want to go into his area, but it's scoped out under paragraph five of statement 54. So the answer is no. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Josh. I think you're, you're on mute, mute Josh. Josh. I forget that I double mute myself often. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, that's a good question. Uh, as Alan said, uh, no, it does not apply to FS 54. It is very much in the plan of my scope uh, right now for the software technology and, in fact, in the first category right now of the cloud service arrangements. So you may be asking in regard to cloud services or you may be asking in regard to software licenses, I think, that can come in subscription form. Um, so uh, long story short, um, all that is planned to be covered uh, in my current software project. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say the name of the person who asked, but hey, I encourage you, if you're interested, to reach out to me and join uh, the working group. Thanks. Hey, Leah. Robin, you have a question? Yeah, sure. Go for it. I don't have a question, but I'd like to answer a question. Shabir had a couple questions about MDNA, and thank you so much. We cannot officially limit your number of pages, and neither can A136. However, that's the word streamlining, and it's one thing that we worked on very strongly with the pilot that um, to help teach agencies how much um, or what streamlining is. So stay tuned for that. Watch out for when the comments come out. We'll also be working on implementation guidance to help with that. Um, but that is the goal, but we can't specifically say um, how many pages you should be doing. Thank you for the questions. Thanks, Robin. Yes, Leah, we have a question on Standard 49, if I may, on public-private partnerships. Sure. Um, yes, the question is, regarding Standard 49, to what extent should entities consider risk? What, would FaceApp consider anything subjective, such as risk related to the, to the non-federal entity's financial position? First question is, um, or the first part of that question is, to what extent should entities consider risk? It is the extent of the risk, contractual risk of loss that exists within a public-private partnership as defined at paragraphs 15, 16, and then 17 goes on to explain risk. So um, to the degree that there is risk in the overall agreement, let me make this point clear. I do this in training all the time. You're just not interested in identifying the risk that your general counsel believes is, you know, um, cordoned off in a legal agreement. No, that is not what Standard 49 is saying. You go to paragraph 24D, the disclosure requirement says you must identify the P3 risk that the P3 partners are undertaking. So you've got to identify all the risk. That's what you have to identify. So let's say it's a $5 billion program. You could argue that's, that's the risk, $5 billion, right? Um, give or take a few dollars, right? Then you have to parcel out, if you will, or parse out what the contractual risks are, including remote risks. And we can get into a big discussion there um, but I don't want to do that here. I just want to say um, if there's risk related to the 
non-federally to the non-federal entity's financial position? Absolutely. That is what you will find, I believe, in paragraph 17, where you, you can relate that back to our standard five on liabilities, where the government may not necessarily be responsible for a bailout, if you will, in this context, but it is an acknowledged event that the government says, well, you know, these poor bankers, what are they going to do with their mansions in South Florida? How are they going to pay those multi-billion dollar loans, right, on those homes and yachts they own? So being facetious, of course, illustrates the point that, yes, we have to be concerned about the risk that exists at the private partner and that is required at paragraph 24D. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dom, and thank you so much to everyone for submitting your questions and to SafeFab staff. I was, my computer was a little slow there, so I appreciate you all jumping in. And with that, we want to keep things moving, and so I am going to start up Robin's slide for the climate panel. Thanks so much, Leah. And if panelists can come on their video and their unmute, that would be awesome. So welcome to the FaceAB panel discussion. This is the first panel discussion we'll have. Dom will follow me with another one. And this is the climate risk and fiscal exposure in the federal government. We'll be spending about 40 minutes on this. Uh, we wanna, next slide, Leah. We wanna remind you that the views are those of the speaker and that official positions of FaceAB are determined only after extensive due process and deliberations. If you can go to the next slide, what will you learn here? You're gonna learn about climate risk and fiscal exposure is affecting all federal agencies. If you're not aware of that, you will be after this panel because it's affecting everybody. The agenda, GAO is gonna talk about opportunities to improve federal planning. Are you planning in your organization and implementation to enhance climate resilience? GSA is going to talk about climate adaptation and resilience and about and a specific story and a, a specific example about protecting land ports of entry, which are mission critical facilities. And we also want you to think about what is your role in accounting for and reporting on climate risk and fiscal exposure in the financial statements. If you go to the next slide, please. We have three panelists two from GAO, Alfredo Gomez and Joe Thompson, and from GSA, Ann Cosmo. And I'm gonna just stay here for a second because I'm gonna read their bios. So Alfredo Gomez serves as a director in the Natural Resources and Environment Team of the US Government Accountability Office, GAO. He manages the team's work in environmental protection issues. His portfolio includes work in cleanup of hazardous substances, drinking and clean water issues, ecosystem restoration, pesticides, toxic chemicals, climate change, and EPA-wide management issues. Mr. Gomez has produced numerous reports and testimonies addressing a wide range of environmental, natural resource, agency management, and food safety issues. Mr. Gomez began his GAO career in the Chicago Regional Office in 1991, working on environmental protection issues. He left GAO to work for the Honolulu City Council where he audited local government agencies and subsequently returned to GAO in 1998. Mr. Gomez holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Rice University and a master's degree in public policy studies from the Harris School at the University of Chicago. And next we have Joe Thompson. He's an assistant director in GAO's natural resources and environment team. He coordinates GAO's climate change work and has been a GAO for almost 19 years. Joe has a BS in environmental policy from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor and a master's of public affairs from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Most of Joe's free time is spent playing with his two and a half year old daughter, Audra, and changing her diapers. It's a good thing he's working virtually. Hopefully she will be potty trained very soon. All right, and last but not least from GSA is Ann Cosmo, and she has quite a lot of acronyms after her name because she has quite a few extensive and amazing um, certifications, but I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you'll be able to see on the slide when you come up. She, Ann, is a climate response architect in the strategic risk management at GSA and Resilience Office of Federal High Performance Buildings. In this role, she safeguards assets, the ones you're working in, from the observed and expected changes in climate 
for prudent investment, risk management, and augments life safety, public safety, health, and security. She prompts design innovation and bolsters our nation's global competitiveness in the emerging sector of climate security, which cannot be offshored or outsourced, and is a co-author of the fourth National Climate Assessment's Built Environment Chapter and the forthcoming fifth National Climate Assessment. She's also certified passive house consultant and permaculturist. Very excited to have these three. They have helped me before in an education session, so it's exciting to have them back. Feels like the band is back together. So with that, I'm gonna go to the next slide, please. And they probably actually want you to go to the next slide. I'm gonna turn this over to GAO and, and I think Alfredo is gonna start first. Well, thank you, Robin, for that introduction. And also thank you for inviting us to be part of this presentation. Um, so as, as you've noted, we wanna talk about the work that GAO has done that's focused on climate adaptation and climate resilience. I mean, first of all, you may ask, well, what exactly is enhancing climate resilience? And really we define it as taking actions now to reduce future losses from climate hazards, such as extreme rainfall, drought, and sea level rise. Now you may also ask, well, why focus on these topics? And really what we found over the years is an increasing uh, cost of disasters that are due to climate change. And we know from experts and studies that these disaster costs are going to increase and are projected to go up uh, because certain extreme weather is going to become more intense and more frequent. Um, and so, uh, for example, you know, you can see that uh, disaster that appropriations for disaster assistance from 2015 to 2021 was 315 billion dollars. Uh, so this is obviously something that GAO takes very seriously and tracks over the years. If I can go to the next slide then. So you may be aware that GAO puts out a high risk report every two years at the beginning of each new Congress. What this high risk report does is it identifies all the areas in the federal government that we see at risk of fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement, or in need of transformation. And so since 2013, GAO has put the issue of climate change on the high risk list report. And really the way GAO looks at it, not surprisingly, is looking at it in terms of growing federal fiscal exposure uh, from climate change risks. And so uh, there are many areas in the government that we've identified where the GAO, uh, where the government is facing a growing federal fiscal exposure but one of the key areas is where the federal government is the leader of a strategic uh, wide approach to climate change. This is something that's been lacking in the past. The other area where the federal government faces a growing federal fiscal exposure is in its insurance programs. For example, the federal government manages the, the national flood insurance program, the national crop insurance program. The federal government as the owner and operator of facilities. I mean, you'll hear from Ann later from the perspective of GSA and structures, but you know, just think about the DOD facilities, Department of Energy facilities, NASA facilities that are on coast or places where they're already seeing effects uh, from climate. Uh, also, the federal government has a role as the provider of assistance and information to decision makers across the government, whether they're local government, state, federal, tribal, private sector decision makers. Um, and then as, as I started talking, also the federal government is the provider of disaster assistance that we see as going up. And so all of these areas are areas that GAO talks about in terms of where the federal government is exposed and ways in which we can limit that, which is through enhancing climate resilience and climate adaptation. Next slide. And so really what we wanna to talk to you about the rest of our presentation is we did a testimony for the House Science Committee uh, last month that really focused on this area of climate resilience and what is it that Congress and federal agencies can do to better improve, uh, improve climate resilience planning and implementation. And I also wanna mention that GAO has developed this framework, which we call the Disaster Resilience Framework. And it's these three guiding principles 
that we want to talk to you some more about that if uh, these things are done, we can do a better job. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Joe to sort of walk us through these principles of information, integration, and incentives. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, very okay. well. Uh, before we jump into the disaster resilience framework, um, I think it's important just to recognize how hard it is to keep track of all the action in the climate change area right now and what that means for, for you as accountants and for anybody working in the federal government or anybody working in government. Uh, the issue is coming at us from every possible angle and everybody everywhere is expecting every level of government to build climate risk into how government operates. And we don't really know how to do that yet. So I'm just gonna spend a very brief amount of time sort of walking through sort of where GAO fits into this in relation to some other things you may have heard about, just to put it in a little bit of context before we jump into the disaster resilience framework. So as Alfredo noted, GAO works for Congress. So we have our sort of government wide story about why anybody should care about climate change. And it's from the perspective of taxpayers and how climate change affects federal programs and costs the federal government money. Uh, just recently, the Office of Management and Budget sort of put together a similar story as part of the budget process through their uh, analytical perspectives part of the budget. It notes that climate change could cost you know, several trillion dollars in the future uh, for federal programs. There's a bunch of assumptions related to that, but the overall story is the same. It's something that we need to pay attention to from a government-wide perspective. And there's a series of white papers that OMB put out recently about, you know, what climate change is going to mean government-wide. So that's fine. That's good. That's an interesting story to have. It sort of explains why we should care about this big dollar values government-wide. But, you know, what do we do about that uh, as a federal government? And, you know, the this administration you know, put out Executive Order 14,008. It requires agencies to produce climate change adaptation plans, which describes how they're going to start managing climate risk in their day-to-day -day operations. And that's really where a lot of GAO's work that, that's formed the basis of the high-risk designation comes in, because we have been conducting a series of work using the disaster resilience framework to provide advice to agencies about how to build climate resilience into their day-to-day -day operations, where to do it, how to do it, not specifically what to do, but what options are available to them. So GAO has done a lot of work in that area. And, you know, we're still figuring out how to do this, but every agency is too. But we're not going away. Um, and, and I don't think the requirements in the federal government are going away either. Um, so this is a good way to jump into the disaster resilience framework. Next slide, please. So when GAO looks at a federal program to figure out how it can improve its climate resilience, you know, we can look at a very specific federal program or sort of a suite of federal programs and how they interact with each other. And we look at it through three main lenses, uh, information, integration, and incentives. And at their core, these ideas are very simple. Does the agency have the information it needs to manage its risk? Uh, is it building those risks into its day-to-day -day operations? And is it incenting the people who it works with who may uh, expose this federal agency to fiscal exposure to make decisions to help manage that fiscal exposure? And, you know, the disaster resilience framework itself is a series of questions and a whole set of criteria that can help provide a path forward for any federal agency to improve in these areas. So next slide, please. And as Alfredo mentioned in our testimony before how science, you know, we laid out uh, several examples of what we mean by information integration and incentives and for specific programs. This is an example of a report we did on Superfund. Uh, you know, it's an EPA program to manage really badly contaminated facilities all across the U.S. Some of these facilities are in locations that are at risk for flooding uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis from, and that, that flooding could be made worse from sea level rise and the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme rainfall in certain parts of the U.S. So there's a bunch of facilities that are at risk that may not be accounting for that risk in how um, uh, the sort of remediation of those sites has been managed over time. And we made some recommendations to EPA to develop the information to help them actually build that risk into their day-to-day -day activities of the Superfund program. So next slide, please. All right, integration. So how do we build uh, the information that's available into our day-to-day -day processes? We've produced a series of reports looking at you know, the Department of Defense 
and how it's beginning to account for climate risk in its day-to-day activities. Uh, this is just a, an example of um, a Department of Defense facility being flooded out. I don't know if you've ever been to Norfolk, but you can see how this might happen in Norfolk. Um, so we've made recommendations to the Department of Defense to build climate risk into its procedures for siting buildings, uh, building buildings, and maintaining uh, Department of Defense structures. So that's an idea of how you would integrate climate risk into your day-to-day activities, uh, in, in this case in a Department of Defense base, but the whole principle can be applied anywhere in the federal government. Next slide, please. And we have some examples of ongoing climate resilience work that sort of points to the idea of incentives. Uh, we're looking at a suite of Department of Agriculture programs using the Disaster Resilience Framework and um, the Army Corps of Engineers Flood Risk Management Infrastructure. And those agencies really have to work with, um, you know, in the case of USDA, farmers uh, and also state and local uh, governments to make sure that um, the federal program provides the right incentives for either individual users or state and local governments to build the climate risk into what they do, because if they don't, we as a federal government are stuck with the bill. And GAO can help provide some advice on how to do that at a, at a high level. So next slide, please. So before we close, and I turn it over to Ann, um, what does this mean for you as financial auditors? Why should you care about this? Well, you know, the whole concept here is the idea of mainstreaming, which is building the risk in day-to-day -day activities of federal government. And, and GAO has a look, has a particular lens that we apply to this. So we'll be we'll be knocking. And right now, the, the the executive branch has a particular lens they're applying with, you know, the adaptation plan. Um, but you know, Executive Order 14,030, and some activity that OMB right now, um, their revision, most recent revision of Circular A136, which is still underway. Um, requires agencies to start accounting for the uh, financial risk posed by climate change in their their day-to-day -day operations and to actually report on this risk. So when GAO and the agencies lay out all the things that they could be doing to manage uh, climate risk in their day-to-day -day activities, this financial reporting aspect can help inform which policy choices uh, agency leaders and even Congress makes about which of those options to employ over the long run. So, you know, we all have a role to play here. Uh, it, it's confusing how we all fit together, but but all of these activities do fit together as part of a larger story. And with that, I will be quiet and turn over to Anne and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Here we go, Anne. We're going to do okay. our TSA. There you go. Sorry. Can you all hear me? I hope Very so. Very well, yeah. Can you see my flag? We can. All right. Well, and, and the reason why I have the flag is because everything that you do, each person that is on this call, which I heard there are 678 people, but those of you that uh, then I presume most are feds or all are feds, you have, as Joe said, and I, it's perfect to follow a GAO in this arena because as Joe said, there is important work to be done by many people and many aspects of this. And this, these activities and what you do each day has a role in making our nation more secure to these changes, which are changing in intensity, frequency, duration. And I wanna say one thing that Joe and Alfredo did not say, the geographic distribution of where these things happen, okay? So let's just dive right in. Uh, I'm an architect, please remember that. I advise other people. I do not run uh, major capital programs. I advise and participate in that arena through the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna start a little bit with context on the executive orders that have been driving some of this. Um, the first one, which was executive order 14008, and that was tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. The interim instructions that came out uh, for that executive order were in March, uh, early March of last year. Next slide, please. And why does this relate to you? It relates to you because in the topic set under that those interim instructions from last March, it had under climate vulnerability assessments, item number five under that topic was to identify how a vulnerability that the agency has identified for climate vulnerability will 
is or will be disclosed in annual agency financial reporting and integrated into the agency's enterprise risk management process. So note to self for everyone on this call, did anyone reach out to you to have a discussion between March and June uh, slash October of last year or yet on this topic set from just this instruction? Next slide, please. Because this is what those adaptation plans uh, really came forth with. Um, and these are all publicly posted if you are in a federal agency and working, um, whether you are in financial accounting or if you're connected to budgetary accounting, the, your agency has a plan and it has a designated agency climate adaptation official. It has five adaptation actions to, that it's pursuing. It has uh, been asked to identify the five top vulnerabilities of which the example in the AFR and the um, enterprise risk management. I will say from reviewing all those plans because I was on detail to the Council on Environmental Equality, working with OMB on those, uh, very few agencies, uh, they're initially looking into that. But the key question for all of you on the phone is, were you contacted and have you been contacted by your agency official or others those that are working on climate adaptation? The other three parts here that are in those plans are efforts to move forward in climate literacy. So we all have a sense of how the discipline that we come from or the skill set is related to understanding the climate and how do we bring that into our work. And the other aspects here as well are the requirements uh, and criteria for climate ready service, supply, sites and facilities, and integration of environmental justice criteria. Next slide, please. So moving forward. May 2021. So there's, as Joe and Alfredo said, there's a lot coming at people and they perhaps are overwhelmed because here this executive order then came forward. Climate related uh, financial risk. In this particular executive order, 14030, it, they're going for the measurement, assessment, mitigation, and disclosure of climate related financial risk to the federal government programs, assets, and liabilities in order to increase the long term stability of federal operations. So, you know, this is another piece much more directed at the community that's on this uh, session today. Uh, and as um, GAO has already mentioned, the A136 and other implications that this is actually touching on. Next slide, please. And then in the next slide, let's see, 14057, if it goes forward, is it moving forward? Hopefully. There it is. Okay, so this executive order that came out in December, which is catalyzing clean energy investments and jobs through federal sustainability. Long title, but here's the short part that we need all pay attention to today. Section 209, which is adapting the federal government to the impacts of climate change. Um, this uh, piece here, item B under section 209, conduct climate adaptation analysis and planning for climate informed financial and management decisions and program implementation. So a number of criteria, most of which are in executive orders, but this is a high risk list, right, item. So, and it's not under sustainability or climate or environmental, it's under efficiency and effectiveness, right? Because at my agency, we're looking at this as, as a risk management activity. So let's talk about that a bit. Next slide, please. So, um, oh, sorry. Polling question first, I'll be quiet. Uh, or do you want me to read the slide, Robin, or how does this work? I can read it. So okay, for, um, for it. Our, our polling question, thanks, Anne. Are you working directly? I can't see it. Let me move my little box here. Are you working directly on any of the climate related executive orders? And this is what this follows, Anne. Have you heard about this? 14008, your plan, 14030, and or 14057. So we just want a yes, no, or not sure, please. I'm hoping that if I have any compatriots from GSA on this session that you're answering yes, because we're meeting about it at noon. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, Leah's gonna give this a minute and then we will look at the answer and then you can keep going from there. Okay. It looks like 86% of participants have responded. That's good. Hopefully we get a few more. Can we get it up to 90 or? Sure. Or Robin, you, you say the word when I should, should close the poll. 
Oh, you can close the poll because we have, okay. I think, 15 minutes to go, and I know we want to have a good Q&A session. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Monica, I will close the poll now, and can you please uh, record the results? Everyone right. should see the results on the screen now. So thank you. Before, yeah, leave this up for just a second. So the 5% mm -hmm. that are saying yes, please reach out to me. Um, I'm looking for people for the task force. For the 10 percent that or it's five 85 percent um you might want to go back to your shops especially cfo shops now are in charge of your erm and find out how you can get involved and learn about it because as ann says and joe and alfredo this is not going away and we are all involved so the more you know about it the more we can um participate and help with it and the not sure that's okay join the 85 percent of no's and same um suggestion for you all right, we can close this and now Anne's going to continue and I think okay, yeah, the last few minutes here to, to discuss land ports of entry. So um, on the screen, uh, what we're going to discuss next, I'm going to be covering, obviously discussing these agencies, but I want to really paint a picture um, because I do not have images. That's a whole nother topic, but uh, paint a picture of the scale and scope um, of the bipartisan infrastructure law investment in my agency for land ports of entry. Um, we have, uh, there are 26 land ports of entry. That is $3.4 billion from that bipartisan infrastructure law. Our primary customer is Customs and Border Protection, but there are also these other tenants agencies that work out of these sites and facilities, uh, USDA, Food and Drug Administration, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, to uh, for these land ports of entry uh, that have large scale site development, multiple buildings um, that we are looking at as it relates to climate. So let me explain that a bit further. So next slide, please. There we go, thanks. So I wanna paint a picture um, here where I want you to imagine Many of you may have or may have never uh, gone through these ports, but imagine 12 to 14 lanes, one direction and personally owned vehicles on the southern border. This is a lot of pavement. This is a lot of flow through a particular site. They have not only personally owned vehicles, they have their tractor trailers, their ports that are solely for commercial inspection and commercial goods to get pass through. There are also ports where people every day walk through on foot, okay, or come through on a bicycle, walk, get off on foot, go through the process, and then go forward, going to work, going to school, whatever it may be. So there's multimodal transport in these sites and facilities that are vast in their acreage, mission critical in what they have to do, and multiple buildings. As I was mentioning, all those different agencies have multiple types of personnel. They have vast types of very specialized equipment that is used to do their job effectively, whether that's scanning a, an entire tractor trailer or tanker that's coming through or personally owned vehicles or whatever it may be, and also the kennels. So just want you to like imagine if you haven't been through these places, they are, they are very complex. They are large generally, particularly in the southern border, but also in the northern, and they are subject to the most extreme climate areas because they are north and south. They're not like uh, temperate. So they get those extremes not only, but they are at geographic extremes as well. So once you just imagine painting a picture, whether it's in Nogales, Arizona, uh, with lots of tractor trailers, the arena of uh, Derby Line, Vermont. Many folks that go through that area, it's northern border, it's Vermont. Folks that are traveling in the summertime, pulling their RVs and their, with their personal owned vehicles and so forth. It's a wide range of the types and scale of each of these sites and facilities. GSA um, of the 167 land ports of entry that Customs and Border Protection works out of, GSA owns and operates 102 of those for the sake of uh, Customs and Border Protection and those other tenant agencies. So with that, just the vast scale, um, the movement of people, and again, the commerce that must be conducted and the national security function 
of these sites and facilities. They cannot be interrupted, relocated, or replicated. They do not have the option to work from home, right? They are exposed to the most extreme and they have all these things have to continue to work. So next slide, please. So observe change. What do we already see at these sites already? The intensity, duration, frequency, and geographic distribution of the urban heat island. Imagine places with acreage of pavement. These are hot places. And on the northern border, even though it's not necessarily going to be as uh, the same as on the southern border of the kind of extremes that could really threaten life safety of people queuing up to get in and through these ports. But on the northern border, it is a change for what is the demand on the cooling degree days and heating degree days for the buildings and those occupants. The extreme precipitation in different forms, whether that is vast amounts of snowfall that are unexpected or vast amounts of rain that are coming down and the subsequent surface flooding, urban flooding, and then particularly on both of these uh, northern and southern border, the availability of water and other uh, services because of their remoteness and the scarcity that may be occur because of drought. Next slide, please. So I would like to remind folks that really this aspect of the expected change, we already have all this observed change that is affecting these sites and facilities. So I want to again paint a picture. Otay Mesa, California, it's a land port of entry. Um, Brush fire in 2019 of August. The port didn't catch on fire, but the migration of wildfire smoke to and through these sites, how do they continue operation? How do they provide safe harbor and shelter with adequate filtration and, and ventilation for the uh, officers and other personnel working out of these sites and the dogs? How is that then held because of the migration of wildfire smoke? The arena then on the northern border where uh, like in Pembina, North, uh, North Dakota, where perhaps the port doesn't flood, but because of the adjacent low-lying areas or the adjacencies to riverine conditions, that the access to the port is flooded, okay? So all of these aspects of the expected change in the intensity, duration, and frequency, and the geographic distribution of extreme weather events that have a climate signal that is driving that intensity, duration, frequency, and geographic distribution. That is what we look at within my agency. Um, those 26 land ports of each entry each have a climate profile developed for those that a team of licensed architects and engineers will use to make their professional recommendations on how does this need to be affecting the design. But fundamentally, folks, here's the deal. It is going to come down to the risk tolerance and risk acceptance of both Customs and Border Protection and the US General Services Administration of what are they able to manage within the budgets that they are already defined. So I'd like to leave it there and just open up to questions and discussion. Um, but I hope I paint enough a picture without pictures um, today um, and open it up to discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. This is Robin back. Um, we've been fielding some questions in the q and I think Joe's been in there and I've been in there. Um, do we have, there was a question about estimates. I sent you a message, Joe. I'm thinking that OMB often puts estimates or methodology in maybe their budget or analytical perspectives. I know we're not gonna have anything like that at this time. Do you have a, an answer to that, I know you start. You answered that question. I just wondered if we have any more information to address that because I know the agencies are going to be challenged with these estimates. You're on mute. Um, which, which question are we talking about here, Robin? Under the Q and A, I um, thought you. It was that. I think USA. It was anonymous attendee. Um, Oh, um, expertise to prepare yeah, necessary so, information applicable to each agency. I think developing a methodology to prepare estimates at a centralized basis. Um, if anybody from OMB is listening, that's a good question for you guys <laughs> to help the agencies with yeah. that. Like they did with credit, yeah. they credit, they, they have the analytics and they have the expected way that they're supposed to estimate for um, credit. So I would assume that maybe they should do the same thing with climate. 
Well, it's tricky. Um, and this, whoever sent this question in sort of touched on a, a central issue that needs to be resolved across the federal government. Uh, and that is, you know, in order to build out the modeling to talk about financial exposures or fiscal exposures, as GAO says it, or to understand what climate change means for you, be it government-wide, agency-wide, or for a particular facility, you have to have um, a simple way to access uh, projections and observations that relate to the decision you have to make. And right now, uh, that's very difficult for individual engineers or facility managers or somebody who's a financial accountant to figure out what information to apply to their decisions. And the federal government can do a better job with that sort of first step in order to allow people to uh, build out the modeling and all the other decisions that they have to make. And we're not quite there yet. There might be some efforts underway in this administration driven by some appropriations language recently, but we'll see how those turn out. And did you have anything to add based on your experience working at CEQ? No, nothing to add. I'm in the executive branch, I have nothing to say. And I'm an architect, so this is out of my realm. I'm happy to listen though. I think it's an excellent question. People need to think about it. Take some astute steps. Thanks, Ann. We have a few minutes for our panel. Um, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will try to answer them there. I don't see any related to climate. I will put in another pitch for technical inquiries. We cannot help you if we don't know. And the general questions like that is not what we're asking for. If you are, you have a building or you have some like damage that has occurred and you've looked at the standards and you're not sure what to do with those, um, from an accounting point of view, those are the kind of questions that we are going to need in your technical inquiry. Because the other thing that that does is it helps you as far as you know, us guiding you on where it is in the standards. It also helps the board so that they know what kind of questions are coming in for that second, that second um, phase as far as the framework. And once the framework is done, then they're gonna start to apply them to the standards to see if there need to be any changes, amendments, a new statement. Um, and we don't have any of those answers right now. So please again. So Robin? Yeah. There was a, there was a question uh, uh, that is probably best posed to Ann that I, I answered, so it may show up in the answered area, not the open area. Um, do federal agencies consider climate impact when determining where to relocate facilities? I did see um, that, Ann. Or can locate you... facilities. Yeah, Ann, can you address hey, so... that as far as, yeah. Okay, federal agencies. Back? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can only speak for my agency and to the extent to which my agency is aware of how much we have yet to do. Um, uh, site acquisition is is definitely a piece where there is a gap. Um, certainly on any capital project, new capital projects that are going out, um, certainly with those land ports of entry, we, we look at that. Is it uh, as robust or mature as uh, given the mission criticality, uh, I think that would be need to be determined by the ERM folks at an agency. Um, but I know at least within my agency, the site acquisition uh, guidance um, that has been drafted, it is not finalized. Um, it's a, it's a space, and I would presume likely at other agencies, and it's in the same or or less mature condition. But that is a important piece. Uh, you need to be very careful where you are locating things long-term. Uh, because when we ask architects and engineers to assist us in evaluating is existing sites or relocating in feasibility studies, that is a discussion. We definitely ask for it in feasibility studies. Thanks, but, Ann. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, I got it, that's it. Feasibility size. Okay, we have, um, we're just about out of time and I see two more questions. Bruce, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question about crazy politics. Um, we're a bipartisan, FASAB is not political, so I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Um, but anonymous attendee, you did ask another question about uh, federal agencies or state agencies, are there any particular effective at climate-related financial risk Canada? 
has implemented TCFD and some of their cities are already starting to, to do this. We will be modeling them and looking at that to see how we can incorporate that. So that's a really good question because as far as from a municipal point of view, there's not very many. So the federal government is, we're stepping into something brand new for those financial risks. California, I think is also doing some TCFD. Most of the um, European or the, um, other countries are recommend or requiring it for their banks and their insurance companies, but not necessarily their governments yet. So we are um, in, a, in a very new place. But if anybody has any sees anything, any information that's coming through, please forward it. And um, we those are definitely questions we'll be working on. So we want to thank you very much. I want to thank the panelists. You guys are awesome, and um, I really appreciate everybody's expertise and. We will now be moving to a five minute break. Thank you. Everybody have a good rest of your session. Thanks, Bye. Anne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, welcome back everybody. We're um, pretty much in the home stretch of our uh, annual update today. And we're revisiting Public-Private Partnership Standard 49. So we have uh, a panel assembled here that represents views from both the preparer and then the auditor side of this equation of uh, how best to implement 49, uh, maybe some best practices. We'll get into that. We'll let the panelists talk about that. But let me just give you a little background before I introduce our esteemed panelists. Standard 49, as you see here in paragraph five, was designated as a supplemental standard to existing standards dealing with long-term arrangements. Alan and I discussed to you how, or with you, how leases can interplay with public-private partners. That, that would be an example of a standard that deals with a long-term arrangement that Standard 49 is supplemental to. Another example would be Standard 2, direct loans um, and guarantees, would be another standard that 49 is supplemental to. And naturally, for those of you that are really thinking about it, Reporting entity, standard 47, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Our panelists are going to really talk about the interplay between, if you will, or the connection um, that standard 49 has to standard 47 reporting entity. And the idea is this, the board envisioned that to avoid duplicative disclosures, you would first turn to the overriding or overarching standard that dealt with the um, long-term arrangement, and then provide those disclosures at paragraph 24 in the standard 49 that were not already provided for, okay? Now, this is an area where, granted, we could do better and issue some implementation guidance, and that's something we're looking at and considering. But with that being said, let me just briefly go over our panelists this morning. Um, as we go to our next slide, I'd like to introduce Ms. Kelly Allison. She will be speaking uh, from the point of view as a preparer working at the Department of Defense. Um, we encourage questions, if you can, using the chat and upvote the question so it makes it easier for us to see which ones we should be answering. Her bio is here. It's quite impressive. She's got um, very good credentials, not only within the federal sphere, but also um, in the commercial sphere as well. Then we'll move over to the next slide where we'll introduce Mr. Christopher Hilton, Chris Hilton, who um, is the DOD Inspector General, up until recently was the, um, I believe, uh, in charge auditor, if you will, of auditing the Military Housing Privatization Initiative, which is the program that Kelly is attempting to get our hands around and um, trying to comply with 49. And 
before I kick it over to them, I want to just say that um, we've looked at uh, disclosures now for a couple of years, and the DOD disclosure at Note 25 is the most comprehensive P3 disclosure, and it really meets the spirit, I think, substantially meets the spirit of what the board was looking for. I'm sure Mr. Hilton will discuss areas where they would recommend some improvements, but if you have any question about what a, and this is my own personal professional view, a good note for P3s should look like, I would definitely go to note 25. Ms. Allison does a great job in not only explaining the program and addressing the key disclosures, I believe, she references related disclosures within the AFR guiding the reader in a very comprehensive and coherent manner to really understand the financial implications as much as you can get out of reading these notes. So with that being said, I want to turn it over to Kelly first and say, Kelly, you know, thank you for overseeing the process that I think generated a very well-written note. And maybe you can share with us some of the lessons learned, some tips, whatever you think uh, would be most appropriate. Next slide, please. So as we get Ms. Allison hopefully off mute, you see some of the things she may be discussing here, implementation issues, maybe some best practices. And then Mr. Hilton will be discussing audit scope and execution and providing some personal tips. The disclaimers that we have at FaceApp staff also uh, are for Ms. Allison and Mr. Hilton. They are, they're speaking in an unofficial capacity. Thank you. Kelly, you there? Yeah, I think, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, thank you um, for the introduction. Uh, I appreciate the kudos on the Note 25. It's still a work in, in progress, but um, we've definitely come a long way, I feel like. Um, but yeah, uh, it's been a long road. It's been three years, I think, so far that um, I've been working on the P3s for the Department of Defense. The main focus has been on military housing because that was brought to light um, as one of the 26 identified material weaknesses for the Department of Defense. So that was the initial focus. And currently, we're still working to identify other potential P3s, um, which, um, you know, leads me to the first point here with implementation issues, um, the data calls versus databases and lead times, et cetera. Um, the first point I'd make is that, um, you know, with all of these P3s, they're, you know, just being looked at, there's a lot of research and analysis that needs to be performed and executed with analyzing all the P3s. And obviously this takes time. You know, one of the things is that it often involves analyzing hundreds of contracts and operating agreements that can be thousands of pages uh, per, per operating agreement. And, you know, it's full of complex language and terms that have to be analyzed. Um, so you can just kind of imagine the time commitment there. Um, and another thing is, you know, finding the quote unquote right person or people or office to take on this responsibility because you're talking about different programs. You're talking, you know, you're looking at MHPI, investigating enhanced use leases, utility privatization, depot maintenance. And so you're talking about different programs, different offices, different areas of responsibility. Um, so that's another um, implementation issue. Um, so, you know, within the various programs and offices, the parties that manage uh, the different P3s or potential P3s, it's just time consuming trying to find the right person. Um, and then, you know, in the case of MHPI, one thing that we came on it um, is that, you know, that program was started 
you know, 30, 40 years ago. So some of these contracts and operating agreements were written that many years ago. And so then reading through that language and translating to how the program is operating now and, and just making that translation over that amount of time and analyzing some of the data and the accounting that was done or, well, that wasn't done um, back then, you know, that was also um, an implementation issue. Um, you know, but some of the best practices that I found um, over time was, um, I have listed here, uh, consistency in the analysis and reporting, which is tough because Again, like I stated, there's a we're looking at different programs. We're looking at a lot of different contracts and operating agreements. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, with military housing, we were looking at that. I created a template that mirrored, um, you know, some of the major determinations that are listed in SS 47. Um, you know, for to define which type of reporting entity. Um, you know, disclosure, consolidation. Um, so I created a template to list all those out, but um, I also added a notes column in there because, you know, a lot of these things aren't just uh, black and white, yes, no, you know, is, you know, can this be found in the budget? You know, you look at the different reporting entity determinations and it's sometimes you're like well I don't know in this case it's a yes in this case it's a no so there's got to be some flexibility or this you know notes column I would say um, to just kind of document some of the outliers or um, you know more uh, difficult or extraneous situations but um, in order to maintain some sort of consistency, I think it's important to, you know, have some sort of uh, template or some sort of consistent methodology in the reporting, you know, because this not only supports like auditability, uh, you know, in responding to audit um, recommendations or questions, but also just accountability um, in reporting across the department and with congruent supporting documentation, um, you know, which is one thing that we're currently still, you know, struggling with. Um, and then my next point um, here is communication, which honestly should probably be the first noted best practice. Um, how things started out with military housing was just, um, open communication um, with the components. I started a working group and, um, you know, we just had open discussions and it just created a forum for information sharing. It was a, it was a structured communication platform to facilitate opportunities to learn and understand from each other, especially when you're talking about some of these pro programs that have complex scenarios and, um, you know, just some of the complex language that are in the contracts that aren't always um, easily understood by the average reader. Um, so I found that to be really important, you know, uh, regular calls with the core group of stakeholders. And, you know, that's often changing because you'll get everybody in the same room and as you're talking about things, then you realize, oh, well, um, you know, this person is really the, you know, the POC really is the SME for this type of thing. And then so through that, you evolve um, your stakeholder list and, uh, you know, then that makes the communication sharing more meaningful. Um, uh, and then, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you know, and also, in addition to identifying the right, you know, responsible parties or SMEs or POCs for each component, you know, a lot of times with P3s, um, you also have to have, um, you know, solid communication with the private partner. 
and you need to have identified the responsible responsible partner um, from that private company who um, you're working with. And so this is a challenge currently that we're having also is identifying, um, you know, where to get the uh, audited financial statements from the private partners for the military housing, um, you know, and, who, you know, who's talking to those people, you know, who's the right person, who's the right party. So extending beyond of just, you know, inside your federal agency, um, making sure that you're communicating effectively and regularly with the private partner, because, you know, we, a lot of, you know, federal government, we work on the typical October, um, you know, fiscal beginning of the fiscal year. And the, some of these private partners, they work on a different, you know, fiscal year, their fiscal year is the calendar year. So there's going to be timing issues and things like that, that have to be considered also. So that comes into play with the communication piece. Um, and then next, um, credibility and corroboration. And specifically, I point to this um, uh, in terms of effective and comprehensible supporting documentation, as I previously said, this is something we're still trying to, um, you know, this is a work in progress for us, but, you know, because there's multiple sources of documentation and obtaining the most accurate information, as I said, you know, there can be timing differences, um, you know, and also with military housing, as I stated, you know, we're looking at uh, reports and documentation from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so um, uh, credibility is is uh, a big thing here with um, obtaining supporting documentation. And then lastly, what I have here is creating milestones. I mean, and, and being flexible to make adjustments on timelines and expectations with these milestones. I mean, so when we first started digging into the military housing P3, um, you know, it was sort of, uh, you know, it's it's been a long journey. And in the beginning of the um, biweekly working group calls, it was just sort of a free-for-all. I mean, it was just really um, a, a space for information gathering. And it took time to create some realistic um, milestones, and um, it took time to assign some real um, due dates for things um, and have some real expectations. So I would say definitely, you know, allow for some flexibilities, but um, creating milestones and setting, and you know, when you get to that point where you can, uh, it's really helpful um, to have those. Um, structured, um, you know, due dates and guidelines and things like that um, to work towards um, and kind of uh, bring things all together. Um, so uh, that's really the, the meat right. of um, the points that I have. No, Kelly, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I know it's been a long journey for you. And I'm just wondering, maybe it's too early in the process, but as you went through, you know, the data collection and this collaboration with the um, component entities, now you're trying to establish communication bridges with the private sector partners. Have any operational issues come up that, for example, might, you know, um, improve the program or where the business office or the program manager might say, hey, you know, this is pretty good. We didn't realize that this was happening. Any, any like, um, ancillary knockoff effects from uh, this process you've been on? Um, I, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I, not yet. I think we're still, you know, digging through some things and still in a, you know, discovery phase of some of the reporting um, issues. Right. At our last uh, P3 training session, um, it was a DOD component, and one of the attendees noted that 
they were having difficulty or they expected to have difficulty with the private partner because the private partner seemed to have no obligation to provide them with the financial information, you know? So um, that was something that, you know, might come up as a lesson learned uh, for the renegotiation, you know, if that ever is to happen, that we'd have better access to records. But in any event, um, it is early, um, and, and that's why we're here. We're trying to get your experience out so it can help other preparers. But, um, Chris, you know, from your point of view, I mean, here you have a new standard. You've got a dedicated uh, staff and individual like Kelly um, really doing a Herculean job. And here you show up with your clipboard and checklist. So what can you tell us about uh, your experience um, looking over the work that uh, the DOD has done to prepare Note 25? Can you hear me, Dom? Yes, sir. Good, good. Um, so I, kind of what I want to go through um, is some of the strengths and, weight and challenges that, that DOD has. And I, I think to Kelly's point, like over the last three years, uh, the department has really improved the MHPI note. No, um, it, it has some ways to go but in some areas, but there's also a lot of things that does really good. Um, first of all, it provides a simple explanation of the program's purpose to include public law citations, provides a general explanation of the design and funding source of the legal entities created, along with DOD's involvement in those legal entities and the expected life of those legal entities. Um, it, it references other notes to prevent duplicative information being included in the, the note. It identifies risks both of the private partner and of the government report or government entity. Um, and it also identifies strategies uh, to mitigate those risks. And uh, I think the, one of the last strengths is it acknowledges there's management or measurement and recognition challenges along with a plan for resolution. And I know people have plugged about the technical inquiry process throughout the conversation today. I want to make another plug for that. Um, when it came to measurement and recognition, um, we reached out to Dom uh, to really navigate uh, the the issues related to MHPI, and I think we're really in a better place because of it. So those are the, the five positives I have. And the challenges, that, um, and I think Kelly alluded to some of them, um, and I think these challenges are not something that is really unique to DOD. I think as, as the reporting entities get farther into this guidance, um, they will identify some similar issues. So ensuring completeness of the universe of reportable P3s. I think this is a bit of a growing pain for the department as they're playing catch up on implementing guidance uh, for existing agreements, but I also think it's an important structure that will allow the department to critically think about and identify its most significant risks of entering into these arrangements and transactions. Um, estimating the dollar values paid by the government over the partnership's estimated life, including historical and future payments. So generally these partnerships are 50-year uh, ground leases, and so you would be estimating the all the payments made. The most significant payment of that is the government um, pays what's called basic allowance for housing, which is an indirect payment to the partnerships through the military service members. It, it, it really acts as a sole source of revenue, um, and, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of money. Um, but but there's challenges with that. Um, it is estimable, but um, there's challenges with getting the military departments to estimate it and ensuring that estimate is consistent. Um, so I do see that as a big challenge. Um, hey, assessing, I, yep. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to kind of pick Kelly's brain too here. This is one of the things we noted that was common, as you said, to all, almost all of the disclosures on P3s, almost all. There were several that did provide estimates of cash flow. Um, what seems to be the biggest hang-up there? Because you would think that if you're in an arrangement um, 
uh, that you would have a baseline to at least estimate what the, what the future cash flows are because the, you know, converse of that would be if you don't know what the future payments are going to be or couldn't likely be or might be, are you really doing your job? So, Kelly, what seemed to be the problem there or seems to be the problem there? Well, from what I understand from some of the components who who don't see value in reporting and some some of these estimates, um, you know, they're based off of uh, legal guidance. So the NDAA determines the bar rate every year, and you know that can be variable year over year, and so. Um, they just don't think that it, um, you know, reports a real fair picture of what the future could look like um, with some of these values, with the boss specifically. I think that's where the biggest hangup is um, as far as reporting estimated values. Right. Um, but and, yeah. It seems kind of like, I, I just want to say a very, I don't know what the right adjective would be, but it's a questionable uh, response that, of course, it would be an estimate. Um, estimates always change. Accounting is sure. full of estimates. Um, Chris, do you have a perspective on this, why they uh, are objecting or find difficult to come up with some type of dollar estimation? I mean, I think Kelly hit on some of the um, concerns that they have, um, such as it paints an inaccurate picture. I mean, I think obviously we read the guidance pretty clear um, at, to, to say that um, it should be estimated. Um, I, yeah, I mean, they use the excuse of, of Congress, that's Bob, but I think my overall perspective on this is the department entered into arrangements whereby they estimated future bob payments to increase at a certain rate and um i, I think that's probably one of the challenges the department has had is they haven't really kept up with the pace of the initial estimate so i, I mean i see that as a highly important um number just because it was estimated initially to set up the arrangement but um I'd say probably what wasn't kept up to date. Yeah, it just seems very strange that, you know, with all the types of different reporting to maybe OMB or directly to Congress uh, that certainly go out more than one year, that there aren't some estimates out there. You know what I'm saying? It just seems kind of specious. Maybe. Yeah, but it, it's they're cool. there. <laughs> You know, but anyway, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. There are other challenges. I just wanted to explore this one a bit because I've oh yeah, several yeah, issues. right. Um, uh, and this kind of flows into the next one. Uh, assessing the impact of cash flows if the identified risks were realized, and we actually had a training session with DOD um, that Dom's um, led, and and. The department kind of went off the deep end. Do we need actuaries and stuff like that when it came to 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 this area? I mean, I, I do think this is probably one of the bigger challenges for auditors and preparers to kind of get their arms around. Um, currently, uh, the, the department DoD simply states that kind of they, they can lose X or lose Y um cash real property but they don't really address the cash flows i mean we've we've concluded that that's insufficient um however it, it may be beneficial i think to provide some sort of additional clarification to help just us navigate this area on on what's expected um to hopefully kind of get everyone on, on the same page um, with that um Fourth one, ensuring dollar values and the notes uh, reconcile to the amounts on the financial statements. Um, obviously, that's an important concept and ensuring consistency and accuracy of the financial statements. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions over the last few years about specifically what was invested um, in the partnerships and and like the 21 statements, uh, which hopefully be correct in 22, but like the balance sheet says that the 
um, partnerships invested uh, 11 point four billion, but the note would reflect at like twelve point three billion. So there's a few things that need to end up there, but I mean that's kind of uh, housekeeping stuff that, that I think we can address this year, and um, so I, I don't see that as a major um, hurdle. Uh, the, the last one, um, identifying amounts of leased land for uh, partnerships that were contributed in kind. Um, kind of the, the linchpin of all of these is um, generally the underlying ground lease so that lasts 50 years with a 25-year option. Um, the department right now has a hard time of identifying, identifying in total like how much uh, was um, least uh so i think that's an important aspect of this and kind of gives the and the, the user reader idea of what was given up along with all the dollar values the cash the real property there was some amount of land given up so i i think those are probably um five of the biggest hurdles for dod and i like i said i suspect those will be um challenges for other reporting entities uh, in the future right and we have a, a Q and A. Uh, maybe Kelly, um, Chris, you might want to entertain. It's really a comment, but the comment comes from an anonymous attendee who says, "Cash flows are estimated if the project involves a direct loan or loan guarantee, um, which seems correct." So, you know, with MHPI, you know, some of your arrangements do involve direct loans and loan guarantees. So so wouldn't those be more or less reasonably estimable, Kelly? Um, yes, they sh yes, they should be reasonably estimable, so then, I would agree. Right, yeah. so then the component units or entities shouldn't really have a problem with, you know, at least providing that information and if they did, Chris, I mean, what would be the IG or an auditor's general take on that, that um, if they can't provide the full estimate, right, but they provide some of the estimate, um, would you see progress? Would you view that as progress, at least, if they tried to make an effort? Yeah, I mean, and I do think that for the loans and loan guarantees, like every year there's an annual re-estimate process. So, I mean, I do think some of that is is already in play in some of the balances reported on the financial statements. Um, the, the right, loan some, of, some of that is reported yeah. in other, in right. another note, um, specific yeah. to loans and loan guarantees. It's note eight. Right. And, and, and now I think it's the, the what if risk were realized is a bit challenging. Um, obviously, like we mentioned, um, the direct loans and loan guarantees, those are re-estimated on an annual basis in Note 8. Um, but the question becomes, okay, you have this cash flow. like, what if the risks are realized? Um, well, that... from an auditor's perspective, are you comfortable that let's say the majority of the component entities or the majority of MHPI agreements from an audit perspective, again, do you believe that the um, components have adequately identified the overall P3 risk to both and all partners? Or, are you, or is it still, or is the jury out on that? I mean, I, I think they've made a lot, a lot of progress um we didn't necessarily identify any additional risks but i i think that they're in a good place there um so i i think that the risk identification i mean that's something that's occurred in the last i think year or two um is definitely a, a stride in, in the right direction i think it, it's the, the quantification piece if the, the risk were realized and just like what is expected of cash flows is on, on a holistic level really because like um i think the, the loans are uh, correct me if i'm wrong two or three billion dollars um 
for MHPI and like they contributed also eight billion dollars in, in almost eight billion dollars in real property, three and a half billion in cash. Um, BA payments are going to be significant, um, uh, north of two hundred billion dollars over the ec- economic life of the partnerships. So um, it's kind of those, those other pieces and just um, right. realizing the effect of cash flows. Um, I mean, if something were to happen. Right, right. I mean, one thing that comes to mind, Kelly, is would it be like, um, would it be better, if you will, less prepare a burden if the standard were changed uh, or we amended it to read more like, well, you know, we would like to have the cash flows over the life of the program. But as a minimum, you've got to provide cash flows over the next five years, meaning if we kind of contain the cash flow measurement to a period, um, a multi-year period, do you think that would make any significant difference to those who are balking at this requirement? Um, Possibly. um, um... Yeah, it's possible. I, I'm not sure because at this point, um, it's a struggle to um, obtain an estimated value for the next year. So I don't know if paring it down, because I mean, the way that a lot of these agreement, agreements are written out, you know, to last 50 years and then, you know, beyond. So, um, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I really don't know that it would be that impactful. Not for maybe not for MHPI, but potentially for some of these other P3s um, that are structured. Some of these programs are, are structured differently, and the contracts are um, a little bit more comprehensive. So possibly, yes. Yeah, so, um, right. Yeah. Right. But uh, no, I know you've got a big job ahead of you, and we're going to kind of round out the conversation because. Um, Kelly mentioned that uh, MHPI is just one of the big DOD programs, but they've got several others, I guess, in the utility privatization area as well as the depot maintenance. Um, And uh, this is all going to take time. So I think it's fair to say um, that, you know, like with any new standard, it's going to take several years to get to the point where I think the disclosure is mature. Uh, the question is, what can we do on our end as standard setters to make it easier and better? Um, so are there any concluding comments that, you know, Kelly, Chris, you'd like to make before we, you know, sign off? No, I mean, I, um, I don't have any. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Oh, uh, I was just going to say that we definitely, um, DOD, appreciate FaceApp support throughout this because um, that has definitely been um, a cornerstone in um, a lot of our successes. Um, You know, of course, we'd love to see a measurement and recognition phase of SFAS 49, um, but, you know, we've been able to use FaceApp's guidance um, to put together um, a comprehensive uh, financial accounting and reporting policy out there for now. Um, so, yeah, we just appreciate face up support um, up till now, and uh, you know we look forward to working together um, to bring this thing even closer to um, being fully auditable in the future. Great. Yeah, thank you for the collaboration. But uh, I'm going to turn this back over. I just want to thank everyone, and I appeal to the audience. Um, you know, uh, public service is not easy, and um, being a public service accountant or a public servant accountant is quite difficult. But people like Kelly and Chris show you and demonstrate, you know, what can happen when sober-minded people take their professional responsibilities seriously and work hard, uh, we all benefit, financial management benefits and our great nation benefits. But with that being said, I just want to thank Kelly for taking time out of her extremely busy day and for Mr. Hilton to take time 
away from his laborious checklist over there as I grill him a bit about being an auditor with a checklist. But he knows I need it in good uh, in good form and good way. But thank you both for being on the panel, and uh, I turn it back to the sponsors of this great show. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great panel. I think now we're going to launch the last polling question. Dom, I'll launch the polling question, and folks should see that pop up on their screen. Oh, yes, I remember this one. All right, we're at about 83% of folks have answered. So if, if you're not sure of the answer, just take a guess. This one here really underscores why the board um, wanted to issue Standard 49, a principles-based standard. Um, you know, uh, governments are using P3s more and more. Uh, they've been using them since, gosh, at least the early 90s, if not earlier. The one I'm familiar with at the military um, Sealift Command was from the 80s. So. Special approval had to be given to DOD to enter into that 25-year P3. But they weren't called P3s back then. They were just called long-term leases. Again, the relationship to leases, you know. But Leah, do we think we have enough? We can close off the poll and... Um... I think so. I think so. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. And Monica, if you can record the results as well, that would be great. Everyone should see the results on their screen momentarily. Very good. I mean, two thirds of you hit the hit this out of the park. It is definitely a problem of obscuring costs, risks, and results. You know, when you privatize things, you've lost control in many respects, even though you think you've gained or or retained control. Um, so the results, whether good or bad, of a outsourced program are often very difficult to see. The risks, of course, we know. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, the private partner, it's on them to take care of this until something happens, like a natural disaster or even something less spectacular. Certainly costs are also obscured because they're off budget and off balance sheet. So the majority of you got that right. I'm proud of you. You did very well. So um, with that, I think, uh, Leo, thank you for the time you've afforded us. Thank you. And just before we wrap up here, I wanted to give everyone um, a heads up about what they can expect after the training in terms of CPE certificates. So first off, I want to say thank you to everyone for your patience and participation today. Uh, I'm just blown away by the number of people who, who joined, and so thank you so much. For those of you who did fill out the polling questions, we will record those results and then eventually you will get a link for a survey. And the survey, we purposely made it one or two questions because we want to make this as easy as possible for you all. And we want your honest, candid feedback. So your results will be disassociated from your name and contact information, 
Uh, none of the FaceApp staff will know who said what. We're only going to get a list of the feedback. So I just that'll be uh, on the the web page of the survey. But I just want to emphasize here as well that we are really interested in ways that we can improve this training in the future. Um, and any other thoughts that you may have. Uh, from there, after you submit your feedback through the survey, you will receive a CPE certificate. And so that is how that will play out. But just give us some time uh, because all of those steps require quite a bit of administrative work on the back end. So we appreciate your patience. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Monica. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Leah. All right. Well, one word I have to say is just wow. This has been an, an incredible um, uh, session, and um, I just want to I want to first thank our board for the continued support of staff's outreach activities. Um, I absolutely have to recognize the amazingly talented FaceApp staff for providing this valuable free training to the federal um, financial reporting community. Uh, I have to give uh, special recognition to Josh and Leah for logistically putting this update together, I mean, from soup to nuts. Uh, I also want to thank the climate and P3 panelists who contributed to the success of this event by providing their uh, great insights. Um, thank you to our co-hosts. Um, from NDU, Dr. Potter and, and Professor Harvey, who are going to be speaking in a couple minutes. Uh, last but not, but not least, I want to say thank you to uh, all the 680 plus attendees for taking the time to participate in this training event. We're always so grateful to the community for your support of uh, a face ad work. I, I took a quick look at some of the attendees. I, I recognize many names, uh, board members, uh, former face ad staff, uh, many task force members, uh, and, and other friends and family of, uh, of face ad. So again, I want to say thank you um, and look forward to uh, doing this again next year, hopefully uh, in person. So now I'll turn it over to our NDU uh, representatives for their closing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Valentine. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, David Harvey. I, I certainly enjoyed the presentation today. I certainly learned a lot. And uh, to echo what uh, Dom was saying, you know, as a country, we're fortunate to have such professionalism focused on the unique uh, federal accounting sector. I'd like to speak a moment about our collaboration between NDU and FaceAB and how it came about. Uh, as background, in case you're not aware, NDU's uh, National Defense University CFO Academy, which operates within the College of Information and Cyberspace, is responsible for educating military, DOD, uh, civilian personnel that are preparing for leadership roles. Uh, this is key so that they're able to ensure that strong financial management practices are in, are in place and make, and so that they can make greater use of financial information in, in making uh, decisions. Um, so how did this all get started? The, the CFO Academy offers a course called the Future of Federal Information uh, Sharing, which includes content on federal accounting standards. And given that the CFO Academy was interested in updating our course content, we knew where to go. And so we reached out to FaceAB for some assistance. Uh, that interaction led us uh, to establishing a, a, a memorandum of agreement between the two organizations. And that was finalized last year. And that provided for a, an NDU visiting professor position to be established and for a FaceAB staff member to hold that position. And so, uh, I, we're grateful and thankful uh, to the entire uh, FaceApp board, uh, Chairman uh, Mr. George Scott and Executive Director uh, Ms. Valentine, so for their support in approving that agreement, and then to uh, Dom for uh, his ongoing service. He serves as the visiting uh, professor, uh, his ongoing service as a professor here at uh, CFO Academy. We thank you for that. Um, 
there's been a number of collaborative efforts that uh, have brought, been brought forth through this effort. Uh, uh, Dom has supported us in terms of course content, uh, using case studies, leading lessons, and also serving as a capstone graduate paper advisor for some of our uh, CFO Academy students. Uh, Dr. Potter, who you'll hear from in just a moment, uh, serves as a member of FaceTab's Accounting and Auditing Policy Committee. And then uh, FaceTab and CFO Academy uh, jointly worked together with the DOD Comptroller's Office last year to host a one-day virtual training course on uh, FaceTab standards. Uh, and that was uh, extended to the DOD's financial management community. Uh, so I think that's uh, uh, very important as DOD works to continue to mature its uh, financial reporting systems and processes, you know, keeping uh, DOD financial management professionals up to date on the latest FaceApp guidance is definitely a plus. And along those lines, uh, both FaceApp and CFO Academy are participants in uh, what DOD's Comptroller's Office is calling uh, uh, FM Vision Exchange Program. It's an hour-long uh, virtual training opportunity to uh, uh, financial professionals there. Uh, the pr program was formerly called the Financial Management Brown Bag Training Program. Uh, last month, I led a, a program on GAO's Green Book, and we had over 1,000 uh, personnel attend. And there's several uh, uh, future sessions that are going to be hosted on FaceApp-related uh, topics. Uh, so Thursday, May 19th, uh, a session on federal accounting for climate-related events, August 18, accounting for general property, plant, and equipment. November 17, accounting for public-private partnerships in the federal sector. And then accounting for internal use software. So if you're in DOD, make sure you take advantage of those uh, training opportunities. And I know, uh, FaceApp reaches out to many different uh, civilian agencies as well. So there's uh, opportunities there, I'm sure. Uh, the CFO Academy, we definitely appreciate our relationships with FaceApp and we continue to work with them to identify and research areas where you know, uh, financial reporting could be improved and uh, uh, imp improve uh, you know, for the benefit of uh, federal financial statement users and ultimately for enhanced stewardship of the taxpayer's dollar. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Potter, who, who will give a brief overview of our graduate certificates uh, available uh, from our college. Uh, over to you, Dr. Potter. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Professor Harvey. And thank you, Monica, and, and the rest of your esteemed staff. Um, we've enjoyed working with them and enjoyed very much working with Dominique Savini, who is our visiting professor. Um, he's, he's an extraordinary individual, and we enjoy his, um, you know, his sharing of knowledge and his friendship very much. So I just want to thank you for that. But what I want to do now is just go, go over our graduate certificates that we have available to give you all just some insight as to what um, the CFO Academy at National Defense University has to offer. So we have right now six graduate certificates that are available, and they are available to anyone. These these types of certificates, um, similar to the ones that you would see at any university, um, allows you to enroll in a program and take five courses, each being three credit hours. And this is an accredited program through Middle States. That who, that's who accreditates our programs, along with the joint staff. And uh, they are very, very competitive in that they prepare CFO types as well as uh, chief information officers, data officers, those um, involved in and working in cybersecurity and in cyber leadership um, and program IT program management um, with a lot of the skills and, and knowledge that they need to progress and move on to those upper level positions, um, whether it be the GS 1415 or SES. So we have a number of those as well as military leaders um, that look to uh, uh, go ahead and, and work towards um, a concentration um, within our program. So as you can see, the general requirements um, are a bachelor's degree with at least a 3.0 GPA, and there's also provisional admission available for those not having a 3.0. Basically, if you have a master's degree, um, that will suffice. They no longer look at the bachelor's degree if it's lower than the 3.0 GPA. 
um, we've lowered the standard. Um, at one point we had GS14 and above, and now we've lowered it to GS13 and above, um, as well as the 04 and equivalent grade levels. Um, and those who have government affiliation, whether you're DOD or in a non-DOD civilian type agency. Um, we also um, have enrollment uh, for people who are interested in outside firms who are, who are not in the uh, traditional federal government, but are in, say, the public sector, the private sector, um, working, say, with an accounting firm outside, and we allow that. That, of course, has a cost. If you are a DOD personnel member, your cost for any of the courses we have at National Defense University are free. There's absolutely no cost. However, if you are, say, in a, in a non-DOD agency and you're a civilian, the cost is $1,100 per course, which is still relatively reasonable compared to universities and colleges outside of a national defense. So the uh, CIS, and we also have a CICIO leadership development program, which we just held a graduation yesterday of uh, nine students. Um, that, each, that usually holds about 20, 20 students or more, but we had nine. We started off with about 14 and a few had to leave due to COVID and some other things. However, we are running the CIO Leadership Development Program um, twice uh, in the next academic year. And it's a 14-week program and it is in residence. So you are a full-time student when you're attending this program. And again, it's free to DOD personnel. Um, so the cost, the total cost, if you were, you know, non-DOD or non-civilian uh, agency, uh, you know, applying to and pursuing one of our graduate certificates would co roughly cost you about $10,750. But for most of you who are within the DOD um, environment, it will be no cost to you whatsoever. Next slide. So this slide just gives you a good picture of the courses that are in each of the six graduate certificate programs. And the one that Professor Harvey and um, Professor uh, Savini and I all pretty much own and work in, and we do very much own that program. Um, the CFO certificate for financial officers, um, you can see that there are five courses, White House, Congress, and the budget. So primarily, you know, the congressional budget process, how does it all work? And the course that we, um, received a great deal of assistance with um, this year was the Future Federal Financial Information Sharing. We got a, a great deal of help um, from Professor Savini as well as from Josh, um, who's also on this call. And they gave us some great insight and, and actually um, owned a few of the lessons. So we appreciated that greatly. Um, the others are risk management, internal controls and auditing. And that's a course that actually could be broken up into three individual courses, but we provide a great overview so that students get a good understanding of their role and their responsibility um, with respect to risk management, internal controls and audit. The other is strategic performance and budget management. Now, this is also a very, very good course, and it talks about um, how you would um, look at performance management using performance measures, um, basically what goes into the, the, uh, the strategic plan and how does the budget process tie into the strategic plan. So you, you get a good overview from this course. It's fantastic course. The other certificates comprise more of the data side, more of the, the cyber side. So we have the chief data officer certificate for those who are interested in wanting to you know, maybe move into or just have a better understanding of what a data officer would do. Um, the Chief Information Officer Certificate for CIOs. And what we have seen is we've seen um, a few students who are CIOs that actually pursue the CFO certificate. And that's a good thing because what we also try to convey in teaching our courses is that there should be a relationship when um, you are in these positions, there should be an understanding um, with, you know, across the aisles as to what another officer is doing so that you are not just the one moving money around, but you actually know, you know the causes and the, um, the issues that go into you know, what they do. Then the other certificates are the you know, Chief Information Security Officer Certificate. Um, this is pretty new. And then we have our cyber leadership, which is, which is a little different from the CIO certificate, where if you are, if you are a CIO in, uh, 
in a leadership position and you just want to have a better understanding, that is a fantastic certificate for one to, to obtain. And then the IT program management certificate. Um, this one is also a good one. Now, as you can see, in looking at the courses, some of the certificates have some, some uh, course overlap, um, where if you're taking the chief data officer certificate, you're also going to take the strategic information technology um, acquisition course, which Professor Harvey teaches. Um, as well, you see it down um, under the, CI, the CIO certificate, and you see it in the ITPM certificate. So there are a number of these courses that do overlap, that have some overlap, where if you take one and you want to pursue another certificate, you are you know, pretty much down you know, a class or two. So um, if you are interested in pursuing any of these certificates or looking at our school, um, could you go to the next slide, please? Our information is here. You can go online to cicndu.edu. The um, Office of Student Services can be reached at the, at the uh, other email address, cicoss at ndu.edu, and their respective phone numbers are there as well. So, and we are in Washington, D.C. We sit in Marshall Hall um, on Fort McNair, very easy to get to. You can you know, see the, 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 the capital from where we are. So very near to a lot of the federal buildings, Pentagon. Um, within a lot of, uh, we're right in the middle of where everybody who is working in, in, in uh, Maryland and uh, Washington and Arlington are very, very close. I will also say that every one of our certificates can be achieved in the online environment. So they, you, do, you are not required to be face-to-face, -face, although we are thinking about maybe bringing some of that back. Right now, every certificate can be obtained in the online environment. So if you have any questions, please feel free to call those numbers or send an email. And um, please feel free, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, our information can also be found at cicndu.edu. Uh, I don't have anything further. Um, I would like to say thank you all for attending the annual update today. Um, again, those of you who logged in with your first and last name and answered all the polling questions, you will be emailed a survey requesting your feedback on the training. Um, your name and contact information will be disassociated from your responses um, so, uh, to uh, provide you that anonymity. And um, this is also to allow you to, uh, to give, uh, honest, good, give good, honest feedback. So upon completion of the survey, you'll be emailed a CPE certificate um, showing your attendance from the training today. So I want to thank you all for attending, and I hope you got some valuable information from today's information. Thank you. Okay, well, that concludes uh, today's training. Thank you all. Have a great day.